Order. This is our September 3rd, 2019 uh, council meeting, and welcome everyone. And Judy, if we could do the roll call, please. Ms. Housh. I'm here. Ms. Lee. Here. Ms. Stokes. Here. Krieger. Present. Sanford. Here. Also present are village manager of Osway San Marone, chief of police. Brian Carlson, sorry, I just blinked you for a second. Public Works Director Johnny Burns. I think that's everyone official. All right. So uh, we're going to start off with announcements. And uh, Marianne, were you going to pull Laura up to talk yeah. about? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Laura um, has come with information about portraits. We're still waiting on batteries for photo. Oh. oh. Okay. Sorry. Well, Laura's got a, a nice I will try voice. to <clears throat> speak out. Um, just want to let everyone know about Porch Fest, which is on <laughs> September the 14th, and the maps are out. The Facebook page is fully populated. It's a celebration, a festival of local music on local porches, and people signed up at the end of July uh, to be bands. And so if you've ever wondered what middle-aged dad rock is, go, it's, it's a band there. So please come out and have fun, and we invite everyone. All right, thanks a lot, Lauren. Um, my understanding is uh, tomorrow at Calypso, there's a fundraiser for yes. Porch Fest. So get out there, drink some margaritas, and support local music. Uh, any other announcements? Um, I have one. Yeah, I, I want to um, remind folks that the um, Village Art and Design Award, the Vita Award, um, has been um, given this fall to the sunflower field at Whitehall Farm and Sharon and Dave Newhart. And um, it was so great when uh, I called to talk to them about that. I talked to Dave Newhart first and he said this is so great because Sharon always called that field her art project. Hmm. And they were really glad that we recognized something like a, a field of flowers as an artistic contribution to the village. So we're going to have a small celebration and a presentation of the award on Wednesday, September 11th at 6 p.m., just right in the driveway to Whitehall Farm um, by the Sunflower Field. So we hope that you come and join us. We're going to try to figure out how to have a little bit of, res of uh, um, refreshments out there in the middle of the field. So we'll see how we do with that. So hope to see you out there. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, I also wanted to mention this Saturday is the 9-11 stair climb. Um, that happens at Main Building, AKA Antioch Hall. So um, you don't have to sign up. You can just show up and uh, um, do your stair climbing. Uh, it's a great event. Any other announcements? <laughs> All right. Um, so we have a consent agenda with the minutes from August 19th, our last meeting. Uh, so I'd entertain a motion to approve. I move. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Agenda. Anything we need to add, change? Yes, I am. Yes. I have a few things. Um, I would like to um, thank Mr. Lee to give us an update about the incident. Um, well, it happened over last week, and I thought maybe if we do that before we do the special report, that we didn't have to do that. Well, um, I mean, I think it can, it can uh, maybe be the beginning of citizen concerns. Okay. So, all right. Also, Mark Ewald from the Environmental Commission is going to be coming sometime in the meeting, probably around 8.30, to give an update on uh, our response and what we're doing regarding the Vernay contamination and the EPA. And so that's old business? Yes. Okay. And lastly, uh, Lisa and I would like to take a little time probably at the end of the meeting during agenda planning to talk about some thoughts we have about commissions and um, reviewing effectiveness with the commissions and ideas that we might have around that put on the agenda in the future but we would like to explain a little bit about it so that sounds like new business even though we've talked about this before but um, okay. okay anything else I've got a uh, commission nomination. 
Okay. Put that under new business. That's for HRC. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, and I'm going to take off the um, active transportation and enhancement committee proposal uh, since I didn't get it in time for the packet, and we'll move that to the next meeting. Okay. Uh, Positions and communications, Marianne? Yes. We had a number of them. Some of them uh, I'll speak a little bit more about. We had two petitions and communications, <coughs> one from the Fleck and one from Tom Mazursky uh, in support of the solar ordinance. We had a report from the mayor's clerk regarding uh, how they uh, are doing their fin financial reporting and some changes in regard to that. Uh, Brian, uh, you submitted a mock-up of a potential improvement, temporary experiment improvement for Walnut and Limestone, and I think this way we can talk about that under the village manager's report. Yes. Then there was a letter from Steve Deal, who lives on North Walnut, requesting action. It was a fairly lengthy letter about changes in traffic and changes in parking, requesting that something be done. His concern was safety. And I would like that, I'd like staff to come back with a response to that at the next meeting. And John Burns has a proposed sign, new sign for the Bryant Center, which we'll talk about under village manager's report. Nick Budis has a draft resolution that council would make supporting uh, access improvements in the Glen. How do you want to handle that? Um, so this would go on the agenda for our next meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, they're going after a Clean Ohio grant. It's for a parking lot, essentially, to allow people to have access to that part of the Glen um, that can't necessarily. That would be very good. Yes. I, I remember when that access existed, and it's very helpful, especially yeah. for people with mobility issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa Dodd sent uh, a symbol that they're doing in Bellbrook called Kindness All Around, that they, they have found in from a Florida school. Mm -hmm. And Kate Hamilton mm -hmm. uh, had a letter with instructions for people who wanted to support Miguel, uh, who is in detention. You know that's good. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's get into legislation. And um, uh, first up, we have Ordinance 2019-31. And uh, Judy, I think we can do that by title only. All right, this is repealing and replacing Section 1064.02, rates, admissions, and season hours of Chapter 1064, Municipal Swimming Pool, up of our 10 streets, utilities, and public services of the codified ordinances in the village of Little Springs, Ohio. Okay, can I get a motion, please? Um, second. Okay. Um, so, uh, this is the second reading. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing, and uh, host way, I'm going to let you begin. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the council package includes the pool rates ordinance uh, changes reflecting the discussion at last council meeting. The proposed ordinance contains one rate for daily emission for residents and non-residents. The rate is being adjusted from, uh, to $4 from three fifty for ages 4 uh, through 18 and seniors 62 and older. Um, and that, and then an additional change to seven dollars from five dollars for individuals ages 19 to 61. The this is the change that we discussed at the last council meeting. We wanted to create a, a, a lower increase, something that was um, perhaps better and much more accessible to both residents and non-residents. So this reflect this change reflects that uh, conversation and that desire. I think the one thing though that we didn't really discuss. But I know you guys did some work on is where you came up with the seven dollars for you know sort of the I guess not youth and not senior rate. Correct. We had done an assessment of nearby pools and splash packs and looked at their rates and their services, and we determined that ours was significantly underpriced and uh, and undervalued based on the dollar amount that we were charging. So that four and seven figure it gets us closer to what area pools and splash. Flash, flash uh, pads um, are, uh, are charging. So we did that, those numbers are comparable to what uh, rates are being charged in the area. 
And why did we decide not to do a resident versus non-resident daily rate? There's a, or why did staff decide that? Right, there's two challenges. One is that we would have to ask and verify residency of all the daily admissions, which uh, creates an administrative burden for the staff, and there's just no way of really knowing that they're showing the proof of uh, a residency. And some folks may come in and may not have that. So um, we thought that a reducing the rate overall would help, uh, help us accomplish both um, reducing rates and uh, not having to deal with the administrative burden of that. We also have data on the number of uh, emissions sales that we had this year. And the non-resident sales is significantly higher than resident sales by the tune of four times the number of sales. Right. So we have some good data that gives us a good idea of where our customers are coming from. Okay. Mm. Questions or comments from council? Well, in, in uh, th th looking at things fairly, to me it seems like people who live in the village whose families pay taxes should have a lower rate, daily rate than people who do not live in the village and do not pay taxes. I, I hear what you're saying about the difficulty. I, I did think that that change was going to be made. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. And, and I, I'll vote for this, but I do think it would be worth figuring out if there's a way that we can easily provide Yellow Springs families with something their kids can bring I'm a Yellow Springs resident because, you know, we, uh, the pool operates as a box <laughs> and I'd like to recoup more of that. Yes, to, to your point, the, the pool is, runs at a loss from those fee structures, so their they're, um, contributions from the general fund to support the pool. Um, and I just want to reiterate that we have programs in place so that if there is a resident that uh, finds admission to the pool um, unaffordable, we will work with them to fi uh, find a way to get them access to the pool. Yeah. My concern is raising the out-of-towners more, like right. $5, for example. No. But anyway, well, and I will say, days. you know, I mean, we haven't crunched the numbers, but just with that $2 increase for non-residents, because that was at around 3000 this year, I mean, that's over $6,000, you know, that will definitely help support our you know public pool um, I mean I will say playing the devil's advocate if we have this data about non-residents and residents I mean we must have some mechanism to determine who's who in general I mean not like a hundred percent but you know I guess if, if if that data is reliable you know we had some way of distinguishing who was a resident and who wasn't. Right, currently it's self-reported. <coughs> so folks are asked, uh, are you a resident or not? And mm -hmm. there's a report in it. Right now it doesn't have an impact. I right. think if we were to institute a, uh, a second uh, pricing option for a resident, non-resident, I think that then we would then need another mechanism to verify that they're a resident. Right. Uh, might, it, might it be possible to issue, you know, what the uh, passes look, look like, the, the little pass, mm -hmm. to, to issue a different color thing that looks just like a pass, that just says, I'm a Yellow Springs, you know, Yellow Springs resident. So even though they didn't have an annual pass, they would at least, you know, just one time prove residency and then have a Yellow Springs resident pass so issue, for a daily, for a daily rate. So issue a pass that then. A, a different form of pass. That then could then use every time they buy a daily. Yes. Mm -hmm. Admissions. Yes. Um, that, that could certainly be something we can look at. So prove the residency one time, and then mm -hmm. they come and back. And they just have a little thing. it on their bathing suit. Yeah, something. I mean, the yeah. kids have them on their bags. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with Marianne. I was expecting to see two different rate structures. Okay. And, I mean, the pool's closed now. I feel it's like, wow, we've been talking about this, like, all summer off and on. But since we do have data, perhaps there is a way to run the numbers and say, um, you know, if the out of town was five and locals were four, or something like that. Really, what is the financial model? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, we can explore that option of creating an identifier for resident and non-resident. However, I think that because of the numbers that we have now, that mm -hmm. the significant users, uh, four times the number of users are out of town residents. That number of residents that are using the daily pool is not significant. The vast majority of season pass holders. Are residents 
And so I think that the residents are, are uh, favor the season pass versus the daily pass. I think those, I don't know what the composition of the daily pass may be visitors and may mm -hmm. not necessarily be residents, but maybe folks visiting Yellow Springs residents. I see what um, you're saying. Yeah, so there, mm -hmm. there are more yeah. challenges there to, to Thank look you. at. Thank mm -hmm. you. Megan, did you want to say something? Yep. Can you come up? I think I, I think we got the batteries now, so. Okay. Um, Hoffman, Yellow Springs News. What happened to the Miami Township rates? Oh, we, yeah. So uh, we we went with a resident, non-resident. So Miami Township is non-resident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments? Um, Okay, well, I will say, you know, and I mentioned this uh, in prior discussions, however we vote, um, I do want there to be information, and again, you know, like a little, like, quad flyer for any resident that does the daily rate to let them know that we have swim for all, that we have passes, and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Right? So, That's something that we would promote at the, at the front desk yeah. of what programs are available, what, and any resources that are available. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, any other comments? All right, so I think we're going to vote on this. And uh, Judy, if you could, oh, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you. And, uh, and then we're going to vote. And Judy, if you could do the roll call, please. Absolutely. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Sanford? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks to staff for working on this. I think it was, uh, it, it was important to get the data. So. Um, okay, uh, next up we have uh, Ordinance 2019-32, and uh, we can do this by title only as well. Okay, this is repealing Section 1042.01, Electric <coughs> Service Charges of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1042.01, Electric Service Charges. Okay, can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Second. All right. Um, all right, Josue, I think this is yours as well. Yes, thank you. The proposed, or, the proposed ordinance before council repealing replacing chapter 104201 electric service charges uh, regarding res, uh, solar generation. This eliminates the existing cap on residential solar, changes the interconnection agreement from net metering to net billing, and establishes a different buy sell rate for residential solar customers, reduces the system size for applicable power demand charges. Over the last two weeks, staff has worked on plans to operationalize the ordinance, which includes determining the net, the new meter pricing, installation of meters required, required to capture data for new residential solar customers, and estimating demand charges. Through this process, we discovered that certain customers would be adversely affected by installing systems slightly larger than K, 10 kWs, where customers will pay a higher electricity bill to the village by switching to solar. We believe it is necessary to adjust the system size requirement for power demand charges from 10 kW uh, to 12 kWs. Uh, the other change that we presented at the last meeting and the, inter that the introduction of this ordinance uh, remained the same, that being that the buy rate is at 11 cents per kilowatt hour and the residents will sell at 9 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about the uh, bump from 10 kilowatts to 12 kilowatts? Yes, the the um, there are some customers who would install a 10 kW system may have a demand that would a, would the demand charge is based per kilowatt of load that they have. So when doing our assessment on the demand charges, those customers may see. Give you an example: someone who may use a thousand kilowatt hours, um, and they have a Five thousand, a um, a five kilowatt demand charge. That's fifty dollars based on ten dollars um, uh, per kilowatt. Uh, that adds fifty dollars to the bill. The net savings that they may generate from by installing solar and selling it to us during the day, consuming it at night, they may only see a realization of forty dollars savings in their their energy bill. So their energy bill will be for the same consumption. And ten dollars more overall. So those folks at right at that uh, size of ten to twelve, um, they may be adversely affected based on their on their peak load and the demand charge associated with their peak load. 
on a 30 minute increments. Uh, Johnny is in the, in, in the room and, and he's been part of the conversation and so has Dan as we were trying to troubleshoot um, <coughs> this issue that's come up. Uh, so the idea was even though there was an average of seven kilowatts, we have enough users that are above the 10 that we wanted to make this modification, is that? Correct, and a lot of that is just based on what a, what may be slightly higher than an average household, not significantly larger, um, mm -hmm. that they would see an increase in their bill, and we're looking at what it what would cost the increase in the bill, and a lot of it is, um, they're not adding an additional load, this is on the existing load that they have in their home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dan, John, is there anything you would like to add? <laughs> Dan, you can't help yourself. Get yeah. up there. <laughs> um, Dan Rudolph. Um, yeah, I think what we, we discussed was that the demand charge, especially if you had items that were heating loads, like charging an electric car while you're drying clothes or something like that, would cost a, a reasonable amount of money, and especially for the sort of moderate size systems that could make those people's energy bills be pretty high. So this this increasing it so we have the the systems under twelve kilowatts seems like a good good alternative to that. Okay. Thanks. John? One of the driving factors that uh, we need to mention is is for the systems there is like ten point eight. So <coughs> ten point eight over it would cost the village more money to make some of it. Because then we go to a manual read system then the, the meter reader has to go out there every month. They have to download the meters, plus they're required to have two meters on the house versus one. So we were spending more money to make just a little bit of money. So by moving it to 12 kW, there's only four people out there now that this will affect. So it's Only like four people that are above the 12 K? Above. So we have two 15s, 123 and 120. Gotcha. That are laying on the desk to be approved. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I'm gonna. This is the second reading, so I'm gonna open the public hearing. Uh, questions or comments from council members? <laughs> that certainly does put it into context. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for all the work that everyone's doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting to see things happen uh, at a, uh, a a nice pace. Uh, questions or comments from uh, citizens? Eric. <clears throat> now we know where this came from. And there are four systems. I guess the question that begs are these four people getting a lot deal? And I wonder if. And you said they're on your desk, so they haven't been approved. I just wonder, can you just say that you can't have them on the floor? I don't know if that's realistic, but mm -hmm. I would hate to see people who buy a 20 kilowatt system and find out they're paying $200 a month for electricity or whatever. Mm -hmm. They just need to be informed in detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So and yeah, let's make sure we do that. Yes, and we will when we have uh, the <coughs> review sessions. Would that happen with Johnny as they're looking through the paperwork and making comments on it? Uh, I I want to point out that Eric was among the first people that knew that he would have to pay more, and he said, "You know what? I'm okay with it," <laughs> and we worked through it. Great. Well, I also want to appreciate the collaboration. I love that you know, village team members got right into it and that citizens uh, were constructive to come to a positive resolution. That's uh, great. It's what we want to happen with every issue. Um, I do want to just reiterate, you know, so that there's no confusion, um, you know, in that table that talks about the buy-sell rates, 11 and 9 cents, <clears throat> I do want to reiterate that the, uh, the ordinance does say Every year, we will look at the overall cost, and ultimately, that's, I think, where council feels very comfortable that we can maintain that uh, equity balance. And uh, so I'm really excited. I hope everybody else is happy as well. Thanks a lot. So with that, um, I'll close the public hearing. And uh, Judy, if you could call the roll.
Yes. Krieger. Yes. Sanford. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Okay. Um, next up, we have resolution 2019-39, and Judy, if we could read that in full, please. Yes. This is declaring intent to create an energy special improvement <coughs> district, or ESID. Whereas Council for the Village of Yellow Springs firmly believes that economic development is essential to the continued financial health and well-being of the village, and whereas this Council recognizes the necessity for programs which would allow special financing opportunities for energy efficiency improvements, technologies, products, and activities that reduce or support the reduction of energy cons consumption, that allow for the reduction in demand or support the production of clean, renewable energy, and that are or will be permanently fixed to real property. And whereas Chapter 1710 of the Ohio Revised Code allows for creation of energy special improvement districts, ECIDs, to be governed by a nonprofit board, and whereas once the ECID is formed, the nonprofit board will approve projects, which, however, will still need to have council approval for the adoption of any real estate property assessments for each project, and whereas initial membership to establish the ECID requires at least one property owner whose project would be financed through this program, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs wishes to establish the ECID under guidelines that are in concurrence with stated village values, now therefore be it resolved by Council for the Village of Yellow Springs that, Section 1, the Village Manager is hereby authorized to engage property owners for the purpose of securing a partnership to establish the ECID and to develop a project plan to be financed through the ECID. Section 2, Council declares its ongoing support for formation and continuation of the ECID. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Osawa? All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this is a direct response to the request from Council at last Council hearing that we express an interest in moving forward and we wanted to signal to the village and to surrounding community that we were serious about our intent to establish an ECID and that we wanted to establish those partnerships to move forward with the ECID and, and, and PACE financing. So this resolution does exactly that. It lets our partners and, and the village and in the township know that we're serious about the ECID and moving forward with it. I think uh, um, in addition, Brian, forward a, a project that may fall in line with this and, and they want to move uh, quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. A residential project, actually. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, questions, comments? So one thing I want to emphasize is when you put down an energy special improvement district that allows for what's called PACE financing, which essentially means when you do energy efficient improve, improvements, for a business, a nonprofit, the schools, a residence, that you can finance that for up to 10 years. And so what happens then is whatever the cost comes off of your property taxes. So it's a great way to do things like solar panels. Um, and uh, one of the things that I would like to add to the first whereas um, is maybe after economic development um, and residential and business energy efficiency, something like that. But I want to make it clear that this is not just for businesses. And even if you are the schools, which doesn't normally get assessed for property tax, they can still set up and use this structure um, to finance some of the energy improvements that I know they're interested in. So, um, so I guess I'm going to make a motion to um, uh, uh, revise as suggested. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? Is it to the first whereas or the second whereas where you would identify the range of entities? I guess I thought about the first whereas because, you know, economic development is clearly about business, but mm -hmm. then I want that energy uh, efficiency or something like that. So would it. you read? Read that first. So maybe it would so say, whereas like Council for the Village of Yellow Springs firmly believes that economic development and uh, residential and business energy efficiency is essential, blah, blah. Or okay. are essential, thank you. <laughs> like having a grammarian. There's an editor in our room right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah, actually, believe me, I appreciate the grammar so much. Um, okay. Uh, Questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, all those in favor? Oh, uh, so I guess uh, I'll make a motion to um, uh, for the resolution to be revised as uh, suggested. Second. All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Great. So now you need to actually vote on the resolution. Can oh, you that's just right. Because we just did the resolution. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, can I get a motion to approve the resolution? I move that we approve the resolution as revised. OK. 
Okay. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, this is a great thing to do, by the way. Mm -hmm. Total no-brainer. Like this is uh, a really nice thing that a lot of organizations in town can take advantage of. Um, okay, so we have one more piece of legislation, which is Resolution 2019-40, and uh, I think we can just read that by title only. Sure, this is awarding a contract for replacement of a collapsed sewer line at 4 Xenia Avenue to Majors Enterprises Pipeline. Okay, can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. Host Wade, right. Johnny? Yes, Johnny. All right. Mm -hmm. This is one that caught us by surprise, because we didn't even know it was there. <laughs> so, um, at 5 Xenia Avenue, we was called out there for a small hole in the blacktop. And they have a laid up storm line. Is this uh, Nippers parking lot? It is. It's got a steel plate over it right now. Yeah. Uh, right now, there is a steel, or steel plate over the hole. But actually, what is underneath is a laid up limestone uh, storm server that it was not on the records or nothing. So, we have actually got an easement on that. Uh, and we're going to be replacing it with a 24 inch storm and replacing the manhole with a laid up brick manhole. And when it rains, it pours through there. Mm. So, uh, we need to be able to replace it. Oh, it's a storm sewer. It is a storm oh. sewer. It goes from a 24 inch to an 18 inch and a 24 inch to a laid up limestone catch base or, or a uh, storm sewer. Drops into another 24, which turns into a 48 to go to the place. And in the middle of it, it's actually caved down. And we actually was aware of it like three days before the hole appeared because the Miller Pipeline couldn't get through it. Mm. And then all of a sudden, the hole. So, so we need to, we're on, if we can get it past tonight, we can maybe have it repaired prior to street fair. Because right now, every time it rains, the whole just I have a question. Is it yes. on private property? It is on private property, but we have an easement for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like almost every meeting we are highlighting more and more the importance of understanding what's underneath the streets. Correct. You know, I feel like we've made a lot of progress in other areas, but this is, I think, just one example. It's really concerning. It's very expensive. Uh, it has to be fixed. And uh, I, I hope that it's not too much of a omen of more of this to come. <laughs> but I mean, I'm so, I'm glad we're looking at it. Well, what is the status of the stormwater survey? Uh, the first six initial uh, areas were done that we had major problems with. It is done. We get the pricing back, so we're trying to see what we can get repaired this year. Mm -hmm. uh, one is Dayton and King, and they just give me the print so we can get a price on it. Uh, the overall survey should be done by the end of the year. Okay. For, we had to get the initial six spots that was giving us real trouble. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we released them to do the rest of it. Okay. Mm. So. All right. Other questions? Uh, questions or comments from citizens? All right. Thanks, Johnny. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, Brian, before you move on, I just have a quick announcement, which if anyone's getting text we were having some trouble with youtube that was it wasn't streaming until about four minutes in and then the audio was a little messed up until about 7 15 all as well at this point okay thank you judy um all right so we're going to move into special reports and we are um talking about our um village policing assessments so i can get us started all right lisa okay um this is a, a big topic we've been working on this for a while, maybe it's helpful to, to give a little bit of a history of how we got to where we are now with a work product in progress in front of us. So back in um, October and then in November with some revisions of um, 2018 as part of the budget process, um, Marianne McQueen and I put together a proposal for a professional services budget for a police assessment, um, just thinking ahead, 
that should we need to do some kind of assessment in 2019 that the budget would be there and available um, in the 2019 budget. Um, so then in February of 20, 2019, in anticipation of beginning to form uh, the Justice System Commission, we decided to move ahead with that assessment. And um, the purpose of the assessment, and you know I'm a nurse, so I use all these kind of nurse terms, so was to do a head-to-toe assessment of uh, the state of policing in Yellow Springs. And, and particularly thinking about the implementation of the guidelines for local policing and how much of that had been successfully implemented. We wanted to look at budget issues. We wanted to look at policies and procedures. This was not in any way about any individual, but more a state of policing. And you know, it never is, um, is easy to take in the results of an assessment. I always think about how um, people don't want to go to the doctor and have lab work done because they would rather just not know if there's something wrong. So it's better to just not have that assessment done. But on the other hand, it's important to have that assessment done because if there's something that you need to attend to, it's ideal to be able to have that identified before it becomes a bigger issue. And that's really how I looked at um, the police assessment and the intention of having it done. So in late March, um, through networking, uh, we identified Bob Wasserman and his partner Bob Haas from Hilliard Hines. These were people that have a lot of experience, even internationally, at doing police assessments and they were engaged um, to do this assessment. And it's taken longer to have the results of this assessment than we had hoped that it would. Um, I think part of that had to do with the travel schedule of the consultants. Um, I think there may, may have been some health issues. I'm not entirely certain about that. But we've all been very anxious to have this and so wanted to bring it forward in this packet, even though it's not a final document. So um, that's why it's marked work product in progress. We uh, think this is a good opportunity to gain comments from council, from the staff, the police department, from the community. Um, we hope that before we get this to final, um, that we can all talk together about any changes or inaccuracies that we might see in this report, about elements that we appreciate and think are particularly actionable, um, or things that might be missing. Um, the other thing that I want to say, just to, to set this up, is that like any assessment, it's at a moment in time. And one of the challenges of how long it took for this assessment to be complete is that time uh, of that assessment, the world has moved on. Since then, we have a new village manager. There have been uh, a lot of changes already, programmatic implementations, policy and process change that are not reflected in the assessment. So as a consumer of this document, I keep remembering when they did their data collection, you know, which was in April, May, primarily. Um, and I think a timeline might be something that would be helpful for the document just to make certain that we remember when this assessment was done. So um, we have some asks for the council, but maybe, well, I mean, one of the things, the way that document is structured, um, it begins with a short summary, an executive, um, summary and then a list of initiatives and then there's it's really long it's like not over 90 pages then there's an extensive body of the document um, and I think it would be helpful to keep focus tonight on that front end of the document particularly the initiatives and for me and, and maybe for other council members it would be helpful Josue to have a kind of a update on this list of initiatives and the status of any of those at this point. 
And I'm ready to provide updates on the work that we've done since I've came into office. So if you want me to jump in, I can do so now. Sure. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, as you know, one of, the, one of the questions that have been asked consistently since I've been attending the council meetings um, is where are we with our emergency management uh, protocols and preparation for incidents? So we devoted a lot of time reviewing the policies, reviewing <coughs> what uh, documentation we have in the office around uh, emergency management. And as a result of that, we've been putting together documentation that uh, helps provide council, provides that information to council, and we've been reviewing uh, policies that have been updated. Uh, so we've been doing that since day one that uh, when I joined the team. So we review policies and they varied um, on the number of topics that, we, that we've been looking at from language access issues to clergy to use of force. Um, we've been talking about the, the citizen boards that we can create to address some of these issues. Um, and, and there's so many, so many more. Um, we've also looked at our emergency management protocols. What what department, what agency is responsible for what type of activity and how will they respond? So in this package, you would see some of that, some of that emergency management um, planning broken out by the type of incident that would happen and what agency will respond to um, what activities. Now, as it relates to the police assessment, in the, in the report, it talks about initiatives to do to address um, uh, the police department and how to get it to a department um, that the consultants think that we need to be. So one of them is development of the strategic plan, performance measures, develop new policy manual that is linked to a vision that is created in the strategic plan. Uh, and then there's a piece on personnel, looking at our hiring practices, creating training and development plan for officers, shift supervision, uh, creating a, a role of an operations officer, and um, creating a substantive specialty training among officers, officers that would be trained in a particular skill set that then could, uh, together as a group, could respond to a wider range of uh, circumstances. Expanding the community outreach specialist position. And um, as you know, we have a part-time position that is our outreach specialist. Uh, so we have some of that uh, already taking place. Uh, there are five, uh, six additional items creating the police structure. Um, which are creating boundaries or districts in which uh, to patrol and officers will be assigned to those patrol areas. Um, addressing tensions within the police department among officers. Uh, there's been some mediated work uh, done around that. Um, and I think the report speaks to this general issue and that we need to address it. Some of that work is already being addressed. Um, on item number number seven is strengthen police outreach to youth. <coughs> Eight, create social media presence supporting transparency. I think that we've um, w we find ourselves this week in a situation where some of that social media presence is required more than it has been to um, provide the facts around the case. Uh, nine, creating citizen advisory and complaints committee. We've been reviewing our policies and we've been talking about what kind of boards um, we can create to have that citizen input. So some of that work is underway. And then looking at a formal process for restorative justice um, and addressing some of our violence. Um, so we, we've, we've done a little bit of work in all of these items. Um, I think one of the things that we're waiting to do more of was the police assessment. What is the police mm -hmm. assessment uh, going to say? And we see this as there's more good and positive things in this report than the negative things. This provides us a, a roadmap um, of which for us to work on. Um, we may not agree with everything that's in there. I, for me, this, is, uh, this report's the first time I'm seeing a lot of the, a lot of the feedback and the, the evaluation. Um, so I'm taking on its value, but I hear from the officers that there's some things in the, in the command staff that some of the, the items are, are, are relevant and there are things that we need to discuss uh, further um, to, to find the validity of those items. So in a nutshell, we've been working on the policies um, specifically to address the concerns around our emergency planning, emergency management planning, and how do those policies tie into that. Um, we've been looking at, at the trainings that are been scheduled, and we've scheduled additional trainings directly uh, associated with that need to beef up our emergency management planning. Uh, so that's been in the work, and we're doing a lot of team development. And uh, Chief Carlson's in the, 
in the audience, and if there's anything I missed, um, please. No, I just wanted to uh, express that we are Mike, here. Please. Sorry. It's all right. We just want to make sure. No, absolutely. The yeah, we're audience at home hears it all. We're looking forward to um, the future and you know the positive changes that that we can address. Um, I am somewhat excited that we have uh, been working on some things to um, counsel to Lisa's comment. Um, some of the things have been in transition, and we've reached a certain point where we'll be able to um, move on from that item. I'm excited about the potential of the new Justice uh, System Commission, and um, I thought it was a good idea to have Corporal Charles, Sergeant Naomi Watson with me tonight, Florence, our Community Outreach Specialist. Corporal Bean was uh, planning on coming, but he had a head wound at the farm, and he is recovering. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so he's thank okay? You, thank you very much. All right. He's, he's okay. Yeah. okay. He's okay. Did I answer your question? Yes, it's okay. really okay. it's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and the exact number of policies that are current and updated are 64, with another 41 that are scheduled for review and update if necessary. So, um, I've lived in Yellow Springs almost 50 years, and I moved here while Chief McKee was chief. And uh, anyone who's lived in town, I see there are a couple people in the room that have been, well, a couple people who grew up here, uh, remember McKee, and a lot has been made of Chief McKee. I will say that just as I am no longer the same person I was when I was 27 years old, uh, Yellow Springs is not the same place. And what is demanded of the police department, as well as everything else in the village government, has changed. And I think one thing that's happening is that we're We've been a small town. We've been able to do pretty well. And now we're in the 21st century. And, and we just have to make some changes. And there are a lot of good things in this report. There are a lot of errors in the report, too, I think. So Lisa and Grammatical Lisa, errors, you well, mean. Well, there are grammatical errors? errors. And I think there are some errors of uh, fact or supposition. But that's for us to discuss. This is not clearly the only time we're going to be working with this document. I mean, this document will be something that will be a resource to us for some time to come. Today, Josue, Lisa, and I talked about how, sh how should we frame this discussion today, and then what should be the next steps. What we decided, I think, and I'm checking this out too, is that we wanted we didn't know how many people would be coming tonight. We wanted to give anyone in attendance tonight a chance to comment on the document if they've read it. We also want to let people know we want to have an extended comment period. And as uh, either Josue or Lisa said, we probably will end up with something attached to the document that would have comments from staff, from the depart police department, citizens, council not necessarily part of the document itself. So tonight, we want, or the three questions that we thought we would start off with and open it up to uh, people in, who are attending tonight are, do you see anything in the document that you think is inaccurate? Um, what do you appreciate? I mean, there were a number of points made in the document that I went, yeah, that sounds good. We, we could be doing that. And then are there some things missing? Those are the three things that we thought we would start off with. So we'd like to open it up first for people here. And then depending on our count, we had allotted 20 minutes. And I guess we can check in and see how that's going. But, but we will be talking about it more. And most likely, then we will also include uh, a special meeting, maybe in October, we haven't decided, a, f a special community meeting just dealing with this outside of a regular council meeting. So, but for now, I'd just like to open it up. Are, are there any people in attendance who Eric? would like to comment on this 
uh, assessment. Hi there, Eric Clark. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for funding this project. That was uh, a nice thing to have. And I have to apologize also that I only got this yesterday and with it being the holiday, I think I was doing speed reading through this thing. To see. Mm -hmm. If there were issues that we had discussed at a meeting that we had had, and um, I think the one thing that um, I'm hoping can be included in there would be something that we had discussed at a meeting with this way, is that there would be just like the village manager has a report to council that we would include a chief's report to council, and this could include items such as anything great going on in the department. It could be uh, anyone who's up for a promotion, any kind of upcoming training that might be uh, coming along, especially if we use the recommendations from the report on having officers <coughs> more engaged with certain specific topics within the village. I think that could be very helpful if we knew who was going to be handling each of these different affairs, and also which uh, areas of the village we want to try and assign officers to get to know a little bit better. I think that those would be just nice little tidbits to have as a public record. It would help, I think, with that transparency issue. And I think that in the report, the one thing that caught me that I liked the most was a, uh, a lot of ideas for having more social media input, which I think right now there's very little of. And I think especially if there was a website dedicated to being able to put immediately any, uh, and it could be a Facebook, I guess maybe it doesn't have to be a specific website, but even a Facebook page, so that if something is obviously happening within the village, that the police would be able to just get on there, type up what it is, everyone could see it. They wouldn't even necessarily have to have commenting turned on for it. It could be just informational. And then from within that, I think that because our village is so extremely engaged in social media, that it would be a good idea if there were a couple officers or somebody who regularly just checked to make sure that the information that is being disseminated throughout the social media is accurate. And then encourage uh, the chief or somebody to get in there and say, well, actually, this is more like what happened, or this is an evolving situation, and uh, let's wait and see what happens before we start making too many comments about it. Uh, just something to put that information in check and make sure that it's accurate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Uh, any other comments? Carlos Village Yellow Springs resident. <clears throat> um, so this just came out, so probably a lot of people haven't really had a chance to yeah. absorb it. I've only read about half, so I'll apologize in advance. So I did do a word search for Justice System Task Force, and it only came up once in the beginning as just we interviewed some of those folks. So the two plus years of work that the Justice System Task Force did isn't even mentioned, isn't referenced, isn't an appendage. There were specific recommendations, those are not addressed. So I was a little surprised by that, and I wasn't on it, I was on a subcommittee, but I know those folks put in a whole lot of work. Um, I didn't see any discussion, I thought it was very, and this is what happens in general with policing in communities, is more is better. You know, we need to increase staff. We now we need an operations specialist and a this specialist, and we need subspecialties. And we need, I mean, having, I, at one time I was a prosecutor in a jurisdiction of 250,000 people, and you have to have a lot of crime to be a specialist in something like murder, for example. So we don't get enough of that, thank God. Occasionally when it happens, you do what? You bring in the specialist. We don't handle that ourselves. We don't have the equipment. We don't have any of that. So, you know, that struck me as a big department, big community kind of recommendation. Um, and then alternative, alter, alternative ideas weren't explored. They were kind of mentioned here and there. But, you know, we, 
village of Yellow Springs has 3,500 people, more or less. There are commute, lots and lots of villages in Ohio that don't even have their own police force at that size. So we spend a lot of money as tax-paying citizens to even have a police force. So I'm wondering if it's, and this question has been asked before by council, is it right-sized for what we need? And then which specialties do we need? For example, um, I went to, to Mexico a couple of years ago, and in the community there was a tourist community. They had um, tourist police. We, we actually could use some tourist police on for street fair. You know, so the you know people who are part timers who come in. That would be a specialty that would be helpful. Um, but so the, there's some things like that um, that weren't explored adequately. It was all just we need more, more, more. And of course, let's put some numbers on that. That means increase the budget a lot. Also, in, since I was village manager, the, I, what I perceive is the police have become more militarized, and this happens in policing in general, but part of that includes using the military structure of, okay, now we have to have corporals, now we have to have sergeants, now we have to have lieutenants, now we have to have captains, and we just keep going on and on. So I'm just suggesting maybe we look at some alternative structures for the police here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Any other comments? Okay, uh, I have a few. Um, so one thing, since uh, you know th this is also council, the full council is just seeing this as well. Um, you know, Lisa and Marianne have been the, the the point people on this. When this report refers to Yellow Springs vision for policing. Does that mean our guidelines for the, village policing? Well, that's actually one of the one concerns of we have. That is our that is our understanding, but that would be an example of an edit okay. that we would need to confirm. Because part of why I ask, you know, so obviously, you know, I want the report to use our language, you mm -hmm. know, um, but I, I got a little bit confused later on in the report when it it. It almost seems like it was proposing creating another vision. Yes, and I think so, it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, so my main comment there is I think that work's been done, um, not only by council, but by the task force and mm -hmm. by the 365 project and a lot of other groups. So I just want to make sure that um, the overall report does reflect, you know, that I, I would agree. That's definitely <coughs> a top issue. And, and as, as Laura also said, the... It seemed like kind of the miss of the work of the justice system task force mm -hmm. overall in the 365 project. Mm -hmm. So another thing that occurred to me as I read through the report, which I thought was really interesting, and it reminds me of something that Judith pushed for a lot, was codifying um, our training and some of our other best practices. Um, and this report, we got some pushback about that in the past, that, that there wasn't really any fit to do that and how would that work. But this report seems to suggest that that is something that not only can we do, but we should do. And so I, I, I really like to look at that because, I mean, you know, and this is kind of what Eric was saying too. I mean, the, the department should be recognized for the fact that we do 40 hour crisis intervention, you know, tra team training. I mean, there are a lot of like great things that we are standardized and doing. And so, you know, I got the impression that this report was saying that that can and should be uh, recognized. Um, and then I guess my other, uh, I, I like that we're thinking about a comment period for citizens and for council because there are several areas where I guess I'd, I'd like to ask the Bobs, you know, is there more detail? Um, you know, in particular when I think about like, yes, of course we need to reduce the tensions internally, but I would like to know if they have some like thoughts about how we do that and not just, you know, bring in a facilitator or whatever. I mean, so something a little bit more concrete around that. Um, and there are a couple other areas like that where I guess when I make my feedback, mm -hmm. that would be my question. Um, evaluations is another huge one, you know. That's been on our radar forever that we want to have a more robust performance evaluation system that recognizes the guidelines for village policing and, and rewards that behavior. Um, 
you know, so this is mentioned, but again, that's always been the kind of work that, you know, we've asked uh, for support in that and haven't really gotten. And maybe ultimately we just have to figure it out ourselves. Um, but anyway, so I guess my third comment is just I'm glad we're taking comments and seeing if we can get more specifics mm -hmm. around some of that. Um, that being said, I think there are some great recommendations. I think that, you know, this, this has been a worthwhile activity and, um, and it, it's given me definitely some food for thought. Um, and, and I also think there were some observations, uh, like Mary Ann said, some which I probably wouldn't articulate them the way they were, but other things that, you know, did make me pause. Uh, you know, Laura, you mentioned the militaristic thing, and that was like highlighted here. Um, I think that's something we need to think about. Um, and I know actually Chief has talked about like getting the uh, kind of cool Hawaiian shirts or whatever, you know, or something before. I mean, you know, so I think it, it's, it's good for us to be pushed um, and, and think about some of the things that we might, you know, not always think about. So I, I think uh, um, there are some good objective uh, observations as well as maybe some that are editorializing. So anyway. So is Kevin or Canada? Well, I mean, I guess in general I'll say I mean, it's, I'm glad that the report does sort of have an overall positive or an upward trajectory in terms of the proposals. Uh, I presume we're going to be asked to give maybe some more detailed, maybe written comments, and I can re re reserve some of it for that. So, uh, but again, you know, it's echoing some of the things we've heard already, you know, budgetary uh, impact uh, of some of the changes. You know, are we talking about additional people or just certain people taking on additional responsibilities, those types of things. So, you know, some of the tactical uh, details of how this would how this would look, and certainly there's a lot of talk about starting with strategy, 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 <laughs> strategy, and then um, rolling that into a budget or having a budget that reflects the strategy that you want to implement. So, again, those are uh, I think questions that other other folks have raised. Uh, you know, the thing I mentioned something about uh, a police website months ago in a different time. Uh, a different season in policing. Um, because again, I know we've always, there's always good stuff going on, uh, but, the, but the headlines were not the good stuff. Um, so, uh, so there's certainly opportunity for excellence in that regard. So um, again, it's got, there's certainly, I think, a positive spin on the report, and I don't mean spin in a negative way. You know, nobody's trying to spin it. It just came out that way. There's a lot of uh, good things that the report suggests. I'm really excited to know that we're down the road a bit on a lot of these initiatives. So we just haven't been sitting on our hands, you know, uh, over the past several months or while the report's been worked on. So um, I would just give a, you know, a thumbs up as it were, and uh, we'll give more detailed written comments later. Okay. Can I? Um, I was thinking back to the idea of. Um, the models of a social justice oriented uh, police department and kind of do those models exist? Are we kind of um, doing something that is talked about a lot but isn't fully implemented in other places just yet? So I'd like to know more about that. Um, from a teacher background, good teachers give models of um, what they want their students to do and so it would be really nice if we had more modeling about what this actually looks like. So. Um, I, I just think that that would be a question for me is do we have, you know, municipalities that are even trying to do something similar, um, even if it's not exactly the same? Because I think that we have a lot of models of um, <coughs> what is considered community policing and that's all different. It all looks very different depending on where you are and depending on which officer you're talking to. So it would be nice to have some more models of what a municipality who says, look, we're going to do social justice oriented policing and these are our steps to do that. I think that's really important, especially if uh, those models do exist. All right. Thanks, Kanana. Uh -huh. Marian? Do you have anything to um, <coughs> Go ahead. I have a few, but I, I'll, you may probably say the same. Um, <coughs> well, and, and the report is 48 pages. All right. Uh, there are some things that I'd like to see different in the report and, and some 
people out there and in here have have mentioned some of those things. The one thing that comes to mind right now that that I think we I don't think we've done, and I do think we, it would be good to figure it out is how there is that partnership with the community. If if there's going to be a change in the police department, police practice, how does the community get engaged with that? He, they talk about that a lot in, in the report, and that s seems to be a pretty different shift, I think. Um, so, th in fact, maybe that is the kind, some of the kind of practical information that we would want to get. How do you set up that <coughs> kind of relationship so chief says, hey, we're thinking about doing X, Y, and Z. How, how does that go to the community and get feedback? How does that, how does that, how do we create something like that? Oh, that's all I have to say right now. Okay, Lisa. Um, you know, I think that, um, like, like you, I haven't had time even to fully digest this. Um, so I do hope that it's on the agenda again and and then maybe we'll have more people who've read it that can come and share um, public comment and then I think we also need a mechanism for people to you know email us maybe to Judy um, to share comments and those could be made anonymous Judy could anonymize those I I um, uh, Josue and Marianne and I talked today, as, as Marianne mentioned, about by the time the document was final, it would have these sort of three <laughs> other documents that went along with it because, you know, this is going to be an important document just for, t you know, in, in, to set in time and so that we can begin to use it to inform strategy but not get too stuck in the mechanics of the document because we could all spend a lot of time editing this document, but maybe that's not the most productive thing that we can do and what we want to be um, is action oriented. So the idea that there would be three, you know, merged comments, the comments of um, council, the comments of the you know, administration that would include the police department staff and um, comments from the community and that all of that would be taken as a whole to decide what strategies to put in place and how to prioritize them. Something that I would want to do, you know, I think this guidelines for local policing document holds up. And, you know, when I start to think about it, these initiatives do map somewhat to the categories of this safety-centered, resolution-oriented, demonstrative strictly inclusive and locally minded. So I do think, um, although the Hilliard-Hines team didn't structure the document that way, I think that it would be interesting to look at how those initiatives map to this because I, a struggle that we've had since developing these excellent guidelines is like, well, yeah, here they are on paper, but how do you bring them to life? So maybe we can say some of these initiatives will help bring this to life. So um, the other thing I, I, I've been thinking about a lot, the word transparency. Because to me, the word transparency has this implication that something's being dropped that you can't see through and that the intention of that is to block. And, and what my experience has been, and as I actually read the document, is that I don't see them suggesting that anything is being hidden but that instead communication is not sufficiently proactive. And I think those are two different things. The intention to hide versus the intention to be very, very open, uh, as Eric was suggesting, some of those ways of using social media. So those are a couple of things that I've already started to think about with the document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of an excellent transition into uh what we're going to talk about yeah. next, but uh, uh, do you guys have any other comments about the assessment? Anything no. from citizens that you want to weigh in on, Laura? 
to the comment on social media, you know, it's really tough for police departments to do social media because you can't say too much for investigatory reasons and also because people have constitutional rights to be presumed innocent, <coughs> proven guilty, and other constitutional rights. So you might be able to do some things. It'll, I think ultimately, I think it's very, very tough to do it well, and it'll be unsatisfactory to a lot of citizens. I mean, yeah, you might put out alert. We've had break-ins in cars on North Winter Street. Okay, that's good. But if you start to say, well, we think so-and-so did it, well, <laughs> that starts to get into a problem area. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you need somebody at the um, <coughs> commander level to review every post that goes out. You really do. So anyway, mm -hmm. I just say it. mm -hmm. it's not yeah, as easy. It's not I easy. feel it's not as easy as this guy made it seem. Right. Like it is. Right. Yeah. None of it is. No. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I want to, I guess, transition us into citizen concerns and because uh, I, I think it is related to this topic. And I really appreciate that uh, Lisa highlighted the open uh, value, which is actually, uh, for those of you that have paid attention, the village has adopted this uh, corkle uh, set of six values. And the O in corkle um, is to be more open. And, uh, you know, I want to start by saying I'm really happy about the press release that Chief put out, and I know Josue was a part of that, because um, that is, to me, a real sign that, that we are embracing that value. Um, we want to be direct. We don't want to be defensive. Transparency is key. So the other thing that I thought a lot about, especially given what's, uh, you know, happened over the last week is, um, the part of the report uh, or the assessment that talks about um, that balance between discretion and, uh, and policy. And one of the things that I think we need to really think a lot about um, is when we establish policies, you know, that, I mean, policy is great. You know, like hotels love to have policies. If you don't like cancel and three days before, we're going to charge you, whatever. You know, it's easy to follow a policy. But the impacts of those fixed policies can, can be really detrimental. And so I know some people are here with, with uh, you know, the situation in mind. And so I do want to um, hand it over to Josue to give that update that Marianne asked for. But I mean, ultimately, to me, the biggest takeaway when I thought about this assessment is how do we strike that balance where common sense and scenario testing and, and some of those other things come into play because ultimately we have a commitment and I actually had Judy print it out when we passed our resolution about being a welcoming community and how we are protecting all of our res residents and all of our citizens we need to make sure that we're delivering on that in every policy that we have and, and whether that's our police department or our village policies or the pool or whatever um, and you know I think this is something that I almost want to read it again but um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a really powerful statement that we are committed to and we have to think very carefully whenever we lay down you know policy which again seems to make sense and is easy to follow but can can have some unintended consequences so Josue. Thank you Brian. Um, I know that most of us probably seen the public statement that we made but I would like to read it because it provides a good summary of what the facts are and what took place and what we've done and looking into the future what we can do uh, and it addresses your point. So uh, on August 20, uh, 26, uh, local resident Miguel Espinosa was taken to the Greene County Jail for driving suspension violations and no operator license, where he was held and subsequently transported to the Butler County Jail relating to a detainer from Immigration and Custom Enforcement. Current police protocol instructs our officers to take repeat offenders uh, of these particular offenses to the Greene County Jail as an effort to change the behavior. We are saddened by the unintended consequences of our protocol on Mr. Espinosa. We as a municipal government and police department must face the reality of the catastrophic damage that our actions can have, particularly on our vulnerable populations. As a result of this incident, we are reviewing our protocols, guidelines, and policies to find a better solution <coughs> that meets our legal requirements, ensures public safety and well-being of the community, and is sensitive to the dynamics of vulnerable populations. 
The Yellow Springs Police Department will continue to explore ways to protect every person we encounter. So this covers some of the basics of what, why uh, Miguel Espinosa was taken to Green County Jail, that there is a repeat offender for driving without a license. Um, and our current policy states that this is what a protocol will be, that we would uh, do this action. Um, so that's where we are. Since then, uh, as you know, we've, I've attended a meeting with the community. A uh, meeting took place at Rackville Chapel. I think it was referenced or published in, uh, there was a post on Facebook. There were around 60 people there. Um, so it's a, it was a good turnout. Um, we did review um, some of the incidents that led up to it. Why did this happen? Um, but a lot of the conversation was, all right, what do we do now? How do we help a local resident who has demonstrated to have uh, deep roots in our community, runs a business, employs local residents, is raising a family in Yellow Springs, and it's a, it's, they're, he is part of the vibrancy of Yellow Springs. And how do we, how do we help that individual? Um, and not to dismiss what he has done or hasn't done, but it's uh, forward thinking. What is next? What, how, do we, how do we help the individual? So uh, that was part of the discussion at Rockford Chapel. Uh, there was a organized effort to get uh, reference letters to um, the, I mean, the immigration attorney. I know the chief submitted one, I've submitted one, I know the clerk submitted one. A lot of folks that knew Miguel and had an interaction with Miguel submitted a reference letter. And this is an effort to expedite or secure that, that there is a bond hearing so that he is out and is able to work through the court system in his case. Um, you know, that's, that's what's happened on our end. We, we're looking at what we can do in our, with our protocols and guidelines. What else could we do differently? And this is, goes to, to your point that you could put in a policy and you think it's going to work well on most circumstances, and most circumstances it would, but there are th times where it won't and it would fail. And how do we um, move beyond that? What's next? Well, and in this case, and I don't know if this is what you were referring <clears throat> to, but we have instructed, I think, our officers not to ask about uh, citizenship status. Correct. That, and that's what they've been instructed to do. In this case, had that question, that, had that information been known, and had the information been known about what Green County does, then it might have taken a different course. And it would have probably been in, in, uh, um, in contradiction to the spirit of the resolution to ask. Yes. Um, however, yes. so knowing all these dilemmas. Right, right, right. right. I think, I think there, there are two things there. One, we have to be aware of Yellow Springs and where it, it coexists <coughs> in Greene County, that we are in, in a conservative county. Certainly, by comparison, uh, Greene County is much more, uh, it's very conservative compared to Yellow Springs, not just now, but historically. Yellow Springs has a, has a very progressive history, and we have to recognize that Yellow Springs is operating in a, in a political climate that doesn't reflect the Yellow Springs uh, values. And the, the county has different practices than our own. So I think that's one thing that we have to be sensitive of, um, particularly in light of this, of this policy. If we, if we don't ask, we say, well, we don't care about those things, right? We're blind to legal status, but then executing our protocols will have this unintended consequence because we ourselves are too small to do everything for ourselves. We're relying on these partnerships, the county jail, the Xenia court, to, to do things with us and for us, and they don't share the same culture values as we do. Um, I'd also like to say that <coughs> we are relying on our police department to help keep us safe. And part of that is ensuring that people aren't driving when they shouldn't be driving, for example, if they've had their license taken away. For example, for being intoxicated while driving. We don't want that on our street. So, and that's part of what our police department was doing. Now, the consequence, as you say, as it went through the different levels was not what we would wish. But there's a responsibility, I think, not just the village, but the responsibility of the people who are driving the cars. Uh, other comments from council members? <clears throat> I 
So, so this is citizen concerns. Uh, I would say anyone that wants to comment on this topic, we should address those first, and then if there are other comments, uh, Laura, you look like you're ready to say yeah. something. Um, so Lisa <coughs> was in on this meeting uh, that we had with the police when the Justice System Task Force Subcommittee, Mayor's Court Subcommittee met, and we we're trying to hash out, you know, um, everything that can go to Mayor's Court should go to Mayor's Court, and let the mayor decide. I mean, the mayor is the judge. The mayor, that's why we elect the mayor. That's who should decide. And we didn't get down, and this is kind of where the work, it gets frustrating because we now have a protocol, this is the first time I've heard about a protocol, that there's some kind of written protocol that says even if it is a nonviolent offense that the judge could hear, that the mayor could hear, that we're giving the police discretion to who they haul to, to Green County Jail and who they don't. It's, it's like imposing a punishment it's really a punishment because they're making a decision. This person is so bad, Brian, you drove three times with, on a suspended license. We're going to decide that you get to go have a, a, a cooling off time in the jail. And too bad for you, you also have a detainer. Now, so on these, everything that can go to mayor's court should go to mayor's court so that the mayors decide that that's the judge. And people have rights. Like, the mayor would have advised Mr. Espinoza, if you plead guilty, it could affect your immigration status, blah, blah, blah. He would have been advised of his rights. I'm sure he wasn't advised of his rights out there on the street. So this is why we need to bring people into mayor's court and why we pay for it. We pay a pretty penny as citizens for that mayor's court. We need to take full advantage of it. And so, and, and that's, I guess, that was one of the pleas from the Justice System Task Force that that happened. Mm -hmm. All right. um, the other thing you might consider, there is, you know, uh, obviously it's political. The Greene County Sheriff has a, some kind of agreement with the Butler County Sheriff to put uh, immigrants in jail. And, and when I was a prosecutor, and I at one time I called ICE on one case, it was somebody from a country in Africa who attempted to kill somebody else. And I called out, this was back at the turn, literally the turn of the century, like 1999. And uh, they couldn't be bothered to come get him back then. That was on attempted murder. And here, they're coming to pick him up on a driving on a suspended license. But my question for you, where council can have some impact, is maybe write a letter to the sheriff and say, because I bet Greene County is paying for that uh, bedtime over there in Butler County. That on our that do not pay for it on our behalf. It's our prisoner. You took it. I, you know, I bet the feds aren't paying for it. So you could say that we do not. Now the sheriff can spend the money the way it wants, but you can make a political statement. At this point, I certainly don't have any other ideas what to do other than we need to drill down on our. I guess we have to get citizen and council involved and <coughs> drilling down on the protocol and do role playing, on like scenario playing, scenario training. Hey, officer, you three time D, you know, Brian House, third time on his DU, on DU, DUS, driving under suspension. What do you do? <coughs> Side him into mayor's car, you know, if there's a non you know, so that we got to get down to that level, apparently, to do, get to impl implement the kind of police we want. I really think we do. You hate to say that, but we really do. Thank you. Yes, and thank, thanks, Laura. Thank you, Laura. I, I want to respond to your, to your, um, statement about the mayor's court and reasons why uh, some items are ineligible. Right now we're issuing a report on a monthly basis on what cases aren't sent to or not sent to the mayor's court. And a lot of those items that are not sent to the uh, mayor's court is because they are a second offense and enhancement. And uh, what? Enhancements. There are other things associated with, well, with, a, with a charge. Um, but typically a lot of those would be repeat offenders. Uh, and those are the things that we're reviewing. Mayor can handle repeat. No. Okay, any other comments? All right, I think I am going to read <clears throat> from this resolution um, because I, I want everybody to be clear on what our policy is and what we've committed to. So this was the resolution we passed last year, 2018-42, affirming the Village of Yellow Springs as a welcoming community for all persons regardless of country of origin, ethnicity, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, income, ability, political affiliation, or religion. 
So I'm just going to go down to the therefores. Section one, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs supports and encourages local and regional efforts to welcome and offer sanctuary to immigrants and others who are being targeted on the basis of religion, nationality, culture, gender identity, race, or citizen, citizenship status. Section two, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs is committed to the protection of law-abiding village residents and visitors from abuse, harassment, and harm, regardless of their immigration or refugee status. Section three, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs directs that no village department may use village funds, equipment, or personnel for the sole purpose of detecting or apprehending persons based uh, sus suspected uh, immigration status and less in response to a court order. In furtherance of this policy, no village office or employee shall request information about or otherwise investigate or assist in the investigation of a person's immigration status unless a criminal warrant exists, a criminal violation was reported, or an arrest was made. And section four, no village department or employee shall deny equal access to village services based on immigration status unless required by law or court order. Such denial of access shall include, but not be limited to, soliciting immigration status in any application for village services, predicating the provision of services on the immigration status of any person, or delaying the provision of services based solely on immigration status. And then finally, it shall be the policy of the Village of Yellow Springs to vigorously oppose any effort to require the use of local taxpayer resources <coughs> for the enforcement of federal immigration policy. So that tells me two things. One is we made a strong statement about what our policies are. We've got to you know, do that scenario testing that you know, I mentioned, that Laura mentioned. And secondly, I agree with Mary Ann. I I'm seeing some conflicts in this that maybe also need to be resolved in terms of how do we like assess that information so that we make the right decisions about immigration status or whatnot. I, I don't think we know enough yet. I mean, we've got we've to learn more. And, and I believe that's what Chief and the police team and Josue are going to do. Right. All right. Um, any other citizen concerns? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going to move into old business. And uh, the first thing we've got is the ballot initiative update. And Judy, I'm going to let you handle that because you prepared some documents on that. And you sprung that right on me before I found it in here. See, so, I'd like to keep you on your toes. Okay. Uh, the long story short, uh, they held We're the excited. And, That's a. Um, basically, uh, the solicitor's argument about the um, village being a charter community and having the right to uh, make this decision held, held water, at least insofar as the Board of Elections did not want to be named in a lawsuit and felt that the decision should happen further up the chain. Um, and so they went ahead and approved as to form. So what you see in the packet has been, it, it is what will appear on the ballot exactly as you see it in the packet. Um, so. I was, you know, any education that anyone wants to do around that either issue, this is what the ballot will look like. It, I mean, there, it doesn't preclude a challenge further down the road if, if the Secretary of State decides they want to challenge home rule power, but that's not our concern at this point. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, Josue, do you want to note what the Board of Elections kind of highlighted in there? hearing because I, I think that's of interest yes I think that there is um, there were there were some comments by members uh, of the election board to move the conversation to talk about the social policy issues and I, I I'm glad that there were two individuals that could steer the conversation back to what was with what falls within their purview and that being is this an action that uh, has it been done correctly does it meet all the administrative um, uh, requirements to come before the election board to approve or deny and there are two individuals that stir the conversation in that direction and that ultimately is how they were able to move forward on this there were folks that were looking to bring in or they introduce a topic in a discussion that was not presented to them there 
know, they were concerned about, well, you know, what do 16-year-olds know? Or <laughs> this non-citizen uh, question. Um, and that, they're, they're not in the, in the packet. All their, well, their legal requirement was just to ensure that this was brought before them in a proper manner and that it met the legal standards. Um, so I'm glad those two individuals were able to move the conversation along and keep the body uh, focused on what their role is and not to meddle on what Yellow Springs wants to do on other things. And I think that's, that's kind of a, what I'm excited about. Regardless of how you feel about whether 16 and 17 year olds and non-US citizen residents should have the privilege to vote or not, what was important in the victory that we secured was the guarantee of home rule. And that's why it's important that this made it to the ballot. Because if, you know, that's how Ohio as well as 20 other states are set up, that localities should be able to have local control. And if this is something that our citizens decide is the right fit, that we should have inclusivity around voting, then we should be able to do that. Um, so we'll see what happens uh, uh, in November. Um, and I expect, as Judy said, that there will be some education around this. Uh, it's kind of interesting how several t topics tonight are kind of uh, uh, converging. Um, but I think uh, I, I was really happy that Judy Josue and Chris uh, made the case for, you know, again, why this is under our home rule powers. Um, and they should not be talking about their opinions about how they feel about who should and shouldn't vote. Okay. Any questions? All right. Uh, Brian. Yes. Oh, so, Megan. Yes. So Sorry. Legal permanent residents or just all residents? So, um, yeah, so basically, um, the, the charter amendment, if passed, would be if you are a resident of Yellow Springs. Um, I think in practicality, and one thing that I believe was highlighted to the Board of Education was, uh, Board of Elections, is uh, if, if you do not have legal status, I think it's very doubtful that you would go to the Board of Elections to register uh, for an election. Um, so I think de facto, it would end up being people that are legal non-US citizens, you know, green cards or, or whatnot. Um, but the reality is, uh, our amendment is saying any resident of Yellow Springs that's 16 or older would be able to vote in municipal elections. Okay. Well, and I left this out and just to follow up, there was some concern raised about potential cost to the Board of Election and, and how it would be handed, handled procedurally. And I would like to give a shout out to Lynn McCoy who handled those things f fabulously and simply kept saying, that's our responsibility to figure out, and we will figure it out. Um, and so it may be that there is some small cost to um, give those persons paper ballots. It certainly wouldn't be anything substantial, and the process is not yet figured out, So, it, but it will be. Hmm. Uh, the only thing I'd like to chime in with it is probably not for tonight, but I do think there needs to be a, a nice communication strategy a comprehensive communication strategy. I do think, and I think this was suggested in a prior meeting, that we formalize some outreach to the schools um, and that, you know, council members or people who are supportive of this would actually go to the schools and visit the classrooms and talk about this as a civics right, right. <laughs> important thing because I think, you know, we, that's probably the best way. But, so I don't know when we're going to do that <coughs> communication strategy or who's on point for that. Yeah. Um, so there is, uh, you know, because we cannot, um, we cannot advocate for the charter amendment as elected officials. Um, you know, we can put it on the ballot, but uh, there is a citizen committee um, that's forming to, uh, to inform the public about that. And regarding the education piece, uh, Mayor Canine is already committed to being part of that education, awesome. which I think all of us should be as well. I mean, it's, yeah, um, makes a lot of sense. Is it possible? For, for the students. So assuming and that, you know, they get to vote, that they would be educated on local issues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but, but we can talk about 
the village council and our role on the village council and why it would would us talking about why as council we thought this was important be construed as advocating for no. it we can give information right that's what yeah. i was thinking yeah. i mean because i think it's important if we're moving in this direction um for the for the youth and the community to have a better understanding of the structure of our government and the role of an elected official and you know so i wasn't saying i go out and say like vote for it right. and also vote for Krieger. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was I was really I was really just saying yeah. that we would be out there, you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and we can definitely I mean we can always inform. <laughs> we just we can't spend taxpayer dollars to, you know, put together a, a pro campaign on this charter amendment. Okay. So okay. Thanks. All right. Um so I saw Mark walked yeah. in. Perfect timing because you're next on the agenda. Vernet update. I'm Mark Ewald, part of the Environmental Commission and on the Bernay Cleanup Subcommittee of the Commission. A uh, quick update about the Bernay Cleanup process. We're in another round of uh, cleanup plans and revisions and comment period. And the, the Bernays contractors have designed a cleanup plan and now it's our turn to look it over and review it and comment on it. Um, the EPA has scheduled two, me two meetings with Yellow Springs in October. Date is yet to be determined in time. But one meeting is a private meeting with village, uh, village government and staff and the EPA. Uh, and that one will be a, a dialogue conversation and, you know, we'll be able to ask questions back and forth with the EP, US EPA. And the second meeting um, is a public meeting, uh, open to the public, and it's going to be more one directional, informational from the US EPA. Um, to prepare for the first private meeting, our subcommittee is gathering documents, and we're going to send out those documents with like a summary, executive summary. To, so the meeting participants can be advised and know how to ask like higher level questions, semi-technical questions. Um, for this for this preparation of this meeting, we recruited uh, help from two professors, Denise Taylor of BD. She's an environmental engineering professor. She's gonna help uh, write a, an executive summary for the meeting participants of like who, what, where, why, and where are we now, what, you know, what's some of the major risks for the public in the village. Um, so that you can just read this one pager, or one and a half pager, instead of having to dig through 400 pages and get lost and things. Um, the second uh, ex technical expert that we recruited is named Abinesh Agarwal from Wright State. Uh, he works in the, in the environmental, uh, something to do with the environmental department. You know, he teaches about remediation and he teaches classes and the students on how to remediate, re remediate sites like this. Um, he, we asked him to provide more technical, technical comments, technical questions. Are we missing anything? Um, and more as like a technical expert. Um, so we're going to be, our subcommittee is going to work, continue to work to plan for these meetings, and we're going to send a meeting invite uh, out via Hostway to probably you and Mary and Brian, and um, also Johnny and the, the guy, the, the head of the water department. Anything else? Um, I think there's a uh, new meeting that's being scheduled, uh, one with the residents um, that we just became aware about. So now there would be third third meeting. Not not nothing for us to be yeah. involved, but just so that you know that there is another meeting that would take place between the EPA and, and the, the residents. So I understand is that the, so the neighbor wants to meet with all of the like active parties. Active parties. Gotcha. You know, okay. one being the village, mm -hmm. one being the general public, and one being the citizen group mm -hmm. in Omar Circle. Right. Mm -hmm. and the citizen group has their own lawyer and technical 
expert on hand. And so they, they want com the EPA wants comments from all the active parties. Mm -hmm. And then on a timeline, the comments will be due at some time early part of next year. So they would not be ex they're not expected in this October meeting. This is more of an orientation yeah. of what's going on, providing an overview of what's in the works in terms of what documents have been provided to them and what does this comment period look like. So then it stretches into 2020. <coughs> so is somebody paying Taylor and Agarwal, or are they doing this it's pro bono? It's on volunteer. So, on volunteer. They're, um, so as part of like a tenure faculty do teaching, service, mm -hmm. and research, mm -hmm. right? And so this is probably falling in their service bucket. So if I understand correctly that they're potentially helping the village team prepare, um, I, I guess one thing I'd be curious about is if there's a way to kind of have a pre-meeting with them to talk about their executive summary and maybe make sure that, that we have it straight. You know, so if in fact it is Josue and Marianne and I or whatever. Um, so I don't know if that's a possibility or not, but um, I would like to have that opportunity. Yeah. to just kind of make sure like we fully get it okay yeah that's a possibility yes i think we can we can arrange for that so i mean it could um, be a phone meeting or whatever you know right right we thought about the orientation being this uh, an opportunity to bring everyone to the same level of shared understanding of what's happening and right. um, what's the information that's on all these documents and it's dense there's things in here that are that are very uh, complex, and we're trying to get it down to the essence. What is it that we, as 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 a government, as key stakeholders, holders, need to know? What do we need to know about the contamination, the technology <coughs> that's being employed? And this is one of the things that I really appreciate about the two um, consultants, the free consultants that we have. Is that they have a different approach to the work, and they're still they they come to an agreement on to what are the things that we should be looking at, but they have a different approach, and we're getting the benefit of having these two different, different from each other different from each other uh -huh. correct <coughs> so, um, um, this month this the subcommittee has another meeting that's Tom Dietrich Nadia and I and, and probably with Josue and we're going to have uh, what's her name the, mayor? The, the representative from the citizen group Marsha Walgren so we'll meet the five of us will meet again mm -hmm. uh, to prepare for the you know for the October meetings and we also have a regular monthly environmental commission meeting too. Right. So there's possibly two, and then this third meeting that you suggested before the October meetings. Okay. And, and Mark and Tom have gone uh, to great lengths of collecting all the documents, creating a README file or a list of files of what's in each document and what they relate to. Yeah, and they're um, like sorted on who's the author, when it was it published, who wrote it, to whom, to whom. And you know, some of them are 200 pages long, some are like a page and a half. So we want to, we don't expect all these meeting participants to read everything, but we want them to be able to ask them a higher level question or a semi-technical question. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make sure I understand. So the first things that our two consultants are doing are helping us ask intelligent questions when we meet with the EPA yeah. then are they also going to work with us to write a letter after that after October to the <coughs> EPA with the things that we now believe should be done for the cleanup yeah so the comment period for the plan is open in the springtime okay. and so we have time to prepare comments and I'm sure we ask them and they'll, they'll help us, you know, okay. draft comments. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Very well, helpful. Mark, are, you, are we going over this again in the village manager report or is that already been done? No, I don't. No, I this think is it. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah. you, Thank you. you can. Leave. <laughs> <laughs> feel, feel happy to stay. You only have to do that once. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Mark. Um, yeah, we appreciate the work. Uh, gosh, I would love to get that brownfield cleaned up. Um, okay, we're on to new business, and uh, Kevin, I think this first one is you talking about uh, an opt-out for the Utility Roundup program. So first of all, let me say that I, uh, I am in agreement with staff, Josue, uh, the folks, uh, ladies work downstairs, and everyone else, everyone else on uh, the Utility Roundup 
subcommittee um, that <clears throat> right for the time being we're going to not uh, lobby for opt out um, but keep the program as opt in um, early on uh, I and and uh, when Lisa was working with us was a proponent for um, the program being opt out and what that means is um, everyone would be uh, put into the utility roundup uh, program and then if you did not want to be in the program you could opt out um, with strong reservations coming from the staff um, they wanted to keep it as an opt-in program and just inform people about it and let them get in as as they uh, as they desire to do so so um, I think having this item on the agenda well, I know having this item on the agenda came out um, of an earlier meeting uh, because there's been some internal conversations about it. Uh, Mary Ann thought we should make more of a public discussion about it. Um, the tides shifted as it were. Um, the staff uh, got more involved with uh, encouraging folks to opt into the program. Um, they're talking to the to residents at, at the window downstairs. The form that everyone has to sign to, to create a new uh, utility account has been modified, giving folks the option to opt into the program. And, and uh, Colleen and her staff have been advocating for that. Um, just this past Saturday, unless I missed a weekend, maybe some uh, recent uh, uh, farmer's market, uh, Colleen was there, <coughs> still waiting for my water bottle. Um, but, uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right, right, right. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Inside joke, inside joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so, so they did a great job. Uh, later this month, there'll be another Thirsty Thursday at um, the brewery to raise funds. Uh, Everyone who's gotten a bill this month or last week when they showed up, uh, you see a, um, a little insert uh, that was in there um, advising and educating, informing uh, what the Utility Roundup uh, program is. Um, we're talking about putting a banner over Xenia Avenue. Um, also, I don't know if you checked email, but I sent you an email recently thinking about maybe uh, reconsidering what we're doing with the grant funds. Uh, maybe not uh, the veteran grant. We can talk about that offline. I don't want to get into mm -hmm. details here. But the fact of the matter is um, the program w will remain opt in. Now, uh, Colleen, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, gave us some numbers. And, and the question we were trying to answer is, <clears throat> in order for the utility roundup program to be self-sustaining, in other words, we don't need more donations, more grants from community foundation or other outside entities, um, at what rate, what percentage of the residential households need to be signed up to the program? Um, the, the subcommittee thought 50% was a good target. Really for it to be sustainable, I think it needs to be closer to 60 or 70%. We can, we can sort of debate that. But we don't have a lot of history on how many households need to be served and we got through the last winter and so far this summer um, and we've been able to serve all the households that have applied for grants again thanks to uh, thanks to the donations that folks have made and to the the community foundation grant so as we move down the road and and we we don't have the opportunity to get more grants Again, the question that needs to be answered is what percentage of the residents need to be signed up for it to remain sustainable? Um, certainly, it is my estimation that if, if we did go to opt out, that we probably get to that number quicker, but probably at a social and political cost. So, um, so we're not going to do it. Um, so we, we are making strides. Um, I don't know what the percentage is right now, but, but I'm not going to worry about it. Um, we will stick with what we're doing. We'll keep the, the campaign positive. We'll ask people. We'll encourage people. Um, my household is signed up, and we're doing an extra $5 uh, each month. You, too, can do the same. Uh, you can do an additional 
$20 a month if you want to, um, or whatever amount. And, and again, so in all seriousness, we, we are trying to make the program sustainable. So uh, there have been a couple of communications, a couple of letters. Again, I think folks saw the opt out discussion on the agenda thinking we were going to talk about that's what we wanted to do. That is months ago how the discussion began. But since then, again, uh, staff has really stepped up uh, and, and taken ownership of this thing. So they're running with the ball. Um, so in, from my perspective, as a member of the subcommittee, uh, I, I'm stepping back uh, and just allowing them to do their work. They're doing great work. Um, the numbers are going up. And, um, and there's no need to panic uh, at, at this point. So um, that's all I have to say about that. Kevin, I have a question. Sure, you yeah, want to come up to the mic? Yeah, if you don't mind coming up, Mark. I think Oberlin has a round up program, right? They do. Have you asked them how many residents they we, have to be sustainable? That well, might be a good reference point. Um, so, so yes, and yes, they have, and we haven't gotten this one question answered. They have made large donations to the program. The the city of Oberlin has, and we have not gotten the answer question to the answers to the question in terms of where those funds have come from. Um, but it, but it's not self-sustainable, self-sustained just through do, just through city, resident donations, and their program, by the way, is opt out. Mm -hmm. So they they put everyone in, and then folks that wanted to get out opt out. Uh, we don't have all the numbers. I don't know, Colleen, if you have the if we've ever got those questions answered from from Oakland. I don't think we did, but but they are doing things differently than what we're doing because we again they're they're putting money in. And I don't know that we have the wherewithal or that special fund to do that. Uh, because if we did it right now, it would be citizen money. It would be your money. But instead of us deciding to put your money in there, we're asking you to put your money in yeah, by signing I'm up. Asking, make sure you ask the Oberlin. Yeah, yeah. We, are, we have been in communication with Oberlin, but there are some questions about <laughs> where that money came from that we don't know the answer to. Right. Colleen, Colleen, did you want to add anything? Mm -hmm. But as they signed up and gave them that decision, so it really is an opt-in at that point. They didn't, but I'll, I'll research. The, the copy that I had, they were an opt-in, and they were larger, so um, they, they did have more funds. Yeah. So they have more money as a, as a municipality to put into the fund. So they certainly are putting money in that, that we've chosen not to, but we, we want to share the love, share the wealth, and let every, as many uh, as are able to do it, you know, and if you sign up for the program and don't do anything additionally, on average, you're only going to donate $6 a year. Because on average, each month, your contribution would be between zero and 99 cents. So on average, 50 cents per month, that's $6 a year. So we're really not asking for a lot. It's not, it's not a big reach. Colleen, you want to come in? And, and just as a, a really good comment, it has grown, and it is the efforts of Everybody and the word of mouth that is going around and at the farmers market um, everybody that I talked to other than that were residents already knew about it and we had a couple more sign up so it's just been a great program and I, I thank you for getting that started last year and we're hoping to keep it motivated and growing. Great, All right. great. Thanks Colleen. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I guess I just want to make sure that uh, any other council members that want to weigh in, I mean personally uh, I support the opt-in and, uh, you know, put our energies towards information um, uh, strategy, but I don't know if, Lisa, did you have Well, any? I mean, when I, when I came into council, this had been on the table, hadn't come to life. It was a significant amount of work to get it going. It's now continued to be a lot of work, a lot of volunteer hours, and I'm really appreciative of of that um 
I would want this topic to come up before the program if and when it looks like the program is failing, I want to bring it up again because I do feel like you've made a unilateral statement that we're not <laughs> of how it's going to be, and mm -hmm. I don't always, I don't necessarily agree. I agree with right now it's growing, and and I really respect you know your perspective and the recommendation from staff. And I also know that people who anybody I've talked to who has said no have said no on principle. They're wealthy people. They say no on principle of giving $11.88 a year maximum to help other community members in need. Okay. So I am concerned about the program and I'm very grateful for the growth and I don't want it to go down. And I'm not saying it is, but before that happens, I want this back on the table. And I mean, I'm willing to take the political flack for $11.88. So I'll hold off for now. So with, with uh, the unilateral statement was that I, as a member of the subcommittee <laughs> um, and a member of council, am not pushing for opt-out, um, um, period. And so <laughs> the committee is handling you know, how it's done, and the committee will decide uh, how it's done and right now no. we're no 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 I think council gets to decide well does it, <laughs> frankly so. I mean I I read Hostway's report I read uh, the letter that Patty Bates sent mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I I actually thought we should do opt-out right but I read what both reports said mm -hmm. and I said and I so I said okay and you know we've talked about this probably for 10 minutes now so I think we yeah. can move on yeah but um, uh, to me, it does seem like it should be a council decision, not... I understood, so I'll moderate my comments, but certainly at the advice of the committee, we'll make a decision. Yeah. And right now, that advice is advising, it, I think, to stay with the opt-in. Yeah, I'll go so on So that is that. where we are. Yeah, and it sounds like we're all um, good with that for now. Did you want to add anything, Kanetta, or...? My only thought was um, for an opt-out system to give a time period for people to opt out before it hits their bill. Um, and mm -hmm. that for the folks who are oh, opting out um, or saying that they won't do it on principle, um, just to let them know that they can put in more than just the roundup amount, that they can donate as much as they want. Um, and I <laughs> I mean, seriously, if they're like, well, I just think that 1188 is too low, you can always <laughs> donate more per bill. So that was just my thought process. Uh, and, and I'll say this last point, we can only budget, if you will, the number of folks that are in, if so, if we know how many households are in, on average, yeah, the max is 11 but on average it's going to be uh, $6 every year. We can only count those heads uh, in terms of the number of households that are signed up. It is the extra cash donations that, that you, you can't count on, but those are large, they are coming in. You know, and I don't know where the breakdown is in terms of how much is actually the, you know, the, the round up to the nearest whole dollar versus the extra cash, but there's a lot of folks who are doing additional donations. Folks are just dropping by the, the bucket or, or doing the, the reach outs or the outreaches that we have. Folks are just giving more money. So I mean, you, can't, you can't guess what that's going to be, but that's been very positive. And I think that's to Colleen's point. You know, the, the funds are growing. So again, okay. yes, we've talked a lot about it. So yep. um, ready to move on. All right, okay. thank you. Um, all right, so I guess the other, the next topic is also yours, House Bill 229, Kevin. All right, uh, I don't, I like short meetings, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but um, the, um, there's an Ohio House Bill 229 that as being a, as a modification to the existing fair housing uh, law here in the state um, that effectively says, it's strengthening the language saying that um, landlords cannot deny uh, potential renters uh, access to their properties based on source of income. Um, the, the bill right now is in uh, committee and they probably won't take it up again until later this month at the soonest. Um, but I'd like for council to consider 
uh, maybe a resolution or, or some other statement in support of that, if we indeed are in support of that. Uh, I don't know that anything will happen uh, in the near term, but the fact of the matter is it's my understanding that some potential residents uh, in the village have been turned away from opportunities to rent properties uh, when they are, are carrying a Section 8 voucher. And so, and, and so Section 8 voucher, a Section 8 is just one of the forms of income that might be discriminated against. Um, and this uh, House Bill 20, 229, again, strengthens the language uh, to talk about the, the illegality, if you will, of denying uh, residents the opportunity to, to apply those vouchers uh, to a rental situation. So again, I'd like for us to learn more about it, but consider uh, so making some So will you do statement. that? Will you stay on top of that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, I think to move forward with this, we should have the, the bill in our packet mm -hmm. so we can read it. Um, and then, uh, I mean, this sounds like something that I think we would all be in support of. So, um, you know, one option is if you want to start to draft a resolution, mm -hmm. Judy's got a template that, you know, you could build that. Okay. I, I mean, it seems like well within the, you know, our values. So, right. um, so that's what I would recommend. And then, you know, we could look at it at the next meeting. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. I will do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, okay. Well, I, oh, no, I yes. just, I think that the main reason why people have <laughs> problems with Section 8 vouchers in Yellow Springs is the cost of the rent because the vouchers will only pay for a certain amount. <coughs> Frequently, rent in Yellow Springs is higher than that amount. And rent is frequently higher because people, the landlords are paying higher property taxes. So I don't know what percentage that is, but I know that that is an issue. Well, um, in my experience with uh, managing properties in Montgomery County uh, that are on Section 8, uh, you know, the amount uh, of rent that the county considers supporting is based on market rate. You know, so regardless of what, you know, how high things are, uh, you know, in West Dayton, properties that, that I'm familiar with, um, properties are, are, are renting for six fifty, seven hundred dollars $700, and they are supported by uh, Montgomery County, uh, Dayton and Montgomery County. For Section 8 voucher. So, Canada, do you? No. Um, I don't know. I don't have any particular experience with market rate um, in Yellow Springs being supported by Section 8, but um, I know of new apartment buildings in Yellow Springs um, being supported by Section 8 and, and being able to accept the voucher. So, I think it's really a case by case basis, but from my understanding, it does go by the market. Yeah. And I can definitely say historically, and you know, maybe it's gotten better, but Yellow Springs has been very limited in terms of Section 8 options. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, I know firsthand when I first moved to town and didn't have a job, uh, yeah, there were basically no Section 8 options. So. Well, a voucher is something you take with you. No, so, I know, you know but not, I had that voucher, but oh, had no okay. opportunity to use it. Oh. So, um, so I don't know if it's changed, but historically, it's been a problem in our community. So, hmm. we will. Okay. Okay. We will discuss that. Yeah. We will move forward. Sounds good. So yes, I'll do the draft resolution, and I've, I think in an email that I sent to Judy a few weeks ago, there was a link to the bill, but I'll get a, a complete. Uh, the link actually did not work, so I, 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 if that's the correct one, I think I popped it back and said the link wasn't working. So. Okay, mm -hmm. well, well I've, I've read it, and I'll get it to you. Cool. Okay. Um, okay, so key, uh, commission effectiveness, Lisa and Mary um, I can, I'll start. So um, I've been keeping track of, you know, two new commissions and possibly, you know, the um, active transportation, right, yep. and a justice commission, and then also what I hope that we have an advisory, a citizen 
advisory board to the police that's something that has been on the table since October of 2018 that was then supported by the police assessment so that's three right and so I would really like to try to find a good chunk of time for us all to talk about um, communi commission effectiveness and uh, I'd like to have it be in a manner that engages the commissions as well not just our opinions but the commission members um, with this idea of what's working what's not could the commission be changed to a meet when needed and you know what other ideas do commission members have about changes um, Marianne and I spoke about this today and and both of us have experience with other organizations and research that says that you know it's difficult to engage younger people people with families and what they are interested in is episodic involvement in meaningful work in other words don't just sign up for something once a month for the rest of your natural born life right so what do you really care about let's pull together a group of people and and act on it and celebrate accomplishment and and then disband now if the same people want to come together around a particular topic that would be fine but you know I just think maybe it's time for us to talk about and look at a better way to address needs that come and go and a better way to use the incredibly talented resources that we have in our community that have very deep expertise and different topics but do not maybe have the time mm -hmm. to, to commit to a commission um, what um, I, I, I'd like to do I think Marianne said she'd work on this with me is um, for the next meeting come up with a real simple template that could be dispersed to the commissions that are just those questions what's working what's not you know could it be changed I mean I think we I would in, and then have each council person agree to facilitate that conversation with their commission put it in writing and submit it back in for review um, I think that we need to be open to um, maybe reconfiguring dramatically the commissions maybe combining some and the, the thing that I've been I've been talking to myself about is perhaps collapsing a commission it's <coughs> not a failure you know it's <laughs> It doesn't mean the commission didn't work or anything like that it just means that times have changed and and we're maybe going into another um, direction and the other thing is we know we have too many plates spinning each of us individually and collectively and I really think that it's time for us to focus in and identify a, a more focused group of activities and the commissions should follow along with that mm -hmm. so which we've technically done <coughs> you know, well with, our with, retreat with and, three uh, more coming online we need we need to right. do but it I, even but more I mean, we've, we've we've technically boiled down that focus is what I'm saying yeah right? mm -hmm. yeah so, oh I see what you're saying so yeah, we yeah. Need to commit to to changing the commissions and yeah. and or figuring out what what would work best right Marianne, do you have anything else to say about that? As Lisa said, topics come and go, and sometimes a topic will will uh, impact more than one commission. And in fact, the Environmental Commission has said, "Hey, we'd like to get involved sometimes with the housing, or we'd like to get involved with Planning Commission as it's looking at environmental issues." So, I was thinking that given the changes in technology there may be some way to take advantage of pulling up people who are interested as Lisa said in working on a certain topic that's what happens like right now with the uh, Verne thing so Tom and Mark and um, Nadia they they're passionate <coughs> about this right now and they're working on it but then another topic in that environmental commission may just sort of drag on and drag on people come to the meeting and on the agenda nothing's really happened so you know we don't want to meet just to meet and we don't want to waste mm -hmm. people's time just to come to a meeting so how can how can we 
ha keep things energized and have people doing work that they want to do and that's needed and not just coming to a meeting if it's not really, nothing's really happening. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'd like this, I mean, it seems to me like the next action item is that um, facilitated discussion. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we need a template document. You mentioned that maybe that could go into our next package. Yeah, just to kinda... I'd, I'd love to do that. It's just real simple, yeah, you know, yeah. but I think if we all ask the same questions. And then the other thing that would be really helpful, Judy, I think it would be to pull the, I don't know if we need the full like charter, but at least the, like the mission statement yeah. of each commission all in one file because I think it will be really important the for the commission members to be able to read them all and you know ask themselves like how do these things overlap and mm -hmm. what is the best service to the village and this is a good time because we're heading into the end of the year right when people on a commission can be looking at okay what have we done this year have we done enough to to value you know continuing the next year what are we are we going to do something next year? What is it going to be? You know, if we have to come up, if at the end of this year we have an annual report that's like maybe up to five pages that includes each commission and the department, does this does each commission have have they done enough that they that they can say in a paragraph, well, this is what we've done. This is the value we've added, mm -hmm. um, and nothing against the people on the commission, but just trying to look at how we uh engage yeah so i want um okay so i think at our next meeting i'd like to look at that template you know just kind of make sure we're asking the questions we need to ask but i do want to add to this discussion uh the capacity component which i think you're also hitting at yes. and in particular we need to make a decision about the justice system commission yes because mm -hmm. we, we've by yeah. you know in my like evaluation of this I'm not sure that we have a current or potentially upcoming council member that has the interest or time to commit to that. And so I think on that one in particular, we need to think about um, other options. And it may be that, for example, that if we do a citizen right. advisory slash review, that that might be. Which is, you know, something focus. that I proposed. So or, I mean. or if, if it's decided and the police department wants to engage in having some kind of community police re conversation, dialogue of having right. a community group that helps do right. that ongoing. Or it might be a manager's advisory board. I mean, board. so, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, but I. And there may be collapsing. So, for yeah. example, mm -hmm. looking at the purposes of the Justice System Commission, which mm -hmm. these are important important topics for which many of us have great passion right. it's just a matter of of capacity and efficiency and focus mm. and you know i wonder if there's a, an opportunity to combine certain commissions and have some transition of membership in order to accomplish um the goals that were important because <clears throat> I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater there with the Justice System Commission. Well, and also, I guess, to me, it's been lingering. And I want, it, I, I want us to have a strategy, because we need something. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I think we need it soon, now maybe, that we're looking at the assessment. Maybe when, we, when Judy pulls up the mission or charter statements for the commissions, we should also include, is it our five goal condensed goals mm -hmm. that each commission would see these are the council goals mm -hmm. right or or village village goals how does this commission interact with those goals yep yep that's a good <coughs> idea um okay good just one other so, thing to consider okay. um now certainly <clears throat> excuse me one of the commissions or it's a commission that we're talking about is the justice uh system com uh, commission which does not have much if any membership right now no. Um, or, or interest in membership. Okay. Right. Um, so let's set that aside. Then let's consider two other commissions, maybe, that um, maybe are not generating enough steam. Um, where you have, you know, what, what, seven people on this commission, you six to seven people on this one, and six to seven on that one, but each of them just 
isn't hitting their stride. You know, we talk about collapsing or combining. Mm -hmm. um, is it too much to start thinking about, well, do we allow the missions to be larger? I mean, we don't, you know, even though we might not have steam or, or capacity, uh, when you have a few people that, that just aren't getting it done, but they're still interested, and you got these folks as well, we don't want to just throw them away uh, as well. So would we end up with a larger group? Um, of course, this, if it's a manager advisory board, you, know, you have the liberty uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's going to be a commission that's got more than the seven people, right. uh, we need to consider what that's going to look like. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, so we'll, we'll follow up on that. Um, it's a good thing to bring up. Um, all right, Kevin, I believe you have a um, nomination. Yes. So um, received information, and everyone has this um, letter of interest on, on the table. Thank you, uh, Judy, for doing that. Um, Lindsey Burke has expressed interest in uh, joining the, the HRC, Human Relations Commission. Um, She's a longtime resident, a business owner, and she's currently running the Village Assistance Network. Um, she's a board member on the Human Group um, and, and other uh, important community action activities that she's been involved with. Kanet and I met with her um, earlier, or last, last week, week. Last week, wow. Thursday. Wow, long week. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're like, uh, we're of a kindred spirit. And so, um, so I would like to, to nominate uh, Lindsay as a member of the HRC. And I'll second that. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Josue, manager's report. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, first of my report is the residential solar. Thank you for uh, passing the ordinance. I won't get into the details since we already covered that. Uh, next is public works and infrastructure projects. Railroad Street parking lot is complete, so you'll see the 45 new parking spaces and people are using it and parking the way that we intended it. So uh, <laughs> I want to recognize Johnny and, and the crew on the great job that they did over there by design. We didn't have to tell anyone how to park. They just figured it out. So wow. we'll see how long it lasts. Are those donation <laughs> boxes out? The donation boxes are up. We have three donation boxes up, one at the railroad um, parking lot and one at the basketball court um, uh, lot right okay. at the entrance. And we have the third one is a donation at the charging station, right in the middle of the charging okay. station. So we um, get any uh, We did, we did, we did. We got $12. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something it's something uh, so over the weekend so i think it'll it'll pick up interest and i think people would value the the amenities that we're bringing to the right. to the to the village uh, uh one additional note on the rail railroad parking uh, lot we've added a cutout so folks can access the parking lot from the bike path so you no longer have to go to the end of the street or uh, down by the the courts to get to the parking lot there's a cut right um uh, about three quarters up from the lot and it pulls into a dedicated bicycle parking space within the parking lot wow. so making it a uh, bike friendly and accessible nice so i guess i want to say two things um i we can let the donation boxes i mean we said we we're going to try that out but um i want us to think about uh a sort of if people aren't donating some signage that strongly encourages it as a way to not like make it a paid lot and then ultimately maybe it needs to become a paid lot um, so I, I, I guess I want us right. to think about like some steps to encourage some support uh, for providing that amenity the other thing I, I didn't want to uh, lose track of is so I know that um, the youth center is renting out that lot to um, peaches mm -hmm. uh, to the beards right. um, now that we have more than doubled the spaces i think that we should get more revenue from more that than, more than double revenue yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course so uh, but anyway but i wanted to you know point that okay. out because uh you know i think uh more capacity and then if they don't need all those spaces we could you know Right, <laughs> but uh, but it's a great way to support our youth programming. What are we Absolutely. renting out? Peaches. Um, four hundred oh. is what they've been. No, no, what? Oh, the the Dayton Railroad Street. 
parking lot. Hmm. So like for street for street fair, if I didn't say that. So every street fair, uh, the Bryan Youth Center used to like manage it as like a kind of VIP parking lot, um, but then it shifted to just Peaches is like, we want all those spots for the vendors that set up in their parking lot. So, but anyway, more so, spaces, I think. Yes, we Ren, so we'll, we'll reach out to uh, Peaches on that rental and we'll update our signage to see if we can encourage more people to donate. I think there's also an effort to encourage uh, to reach out to the benefit to the businesses because I think they're the <coughs> beneficiaries of additional parking, better layout of the parking. So we'll also reach out to them and see if we get anything. Okay, great. All right, on the Bryan Center parking, we've uh, you know there's additional parking space that's going on there. We expect to finish that project on the 29th. Um, the driveway is complete, repairs and fence painting is complete. We've added additional lining, uh, lighting with a manual timer. I don't know if you've seen the basketball courts, but the electric power team added a, a, a knob, a, a manual timer, so they can add up to an hour and the lights turn on and then they automatically turn off. So it doesn't require someone in the back office turning on and off the lights. So nice feature. Less light pollution. Yes. <laughs> Laura Curlis. Hey, I'm all <laughs> <laughs> so power washing and seal coating is underway on the courts this week. Uh, repairs and cleanup on the hillside. Where, uh, uh, the stairs and the storm drain is in progress. We're trying to figure out a solution for the stairs and how the water runs off that area. So we're working on that. Um, we got power washing at the, at the John Bryan Center. We've got the quarry. Uh, sewer line replacement project that you just voted on earlier. Um, I'll skip over the pool cells. The emergency management plan. In your package, you should see an emergency plan uh, preparedness update. It includes a number of policies that we reviewed today. That's 64 with an additional 41 that are under review. Uh, efforts that are currently underway, the police command staff participated in an active threat um, training session on August 20 and 21st at the Montgomery County, and we've uh, updated our roles and responsibility for the emergency support functions for local incidents, which it's attached to your re the report. Um, unless you need me to, we can go by area. There are several areas covered, transportation, communication, public works, and engineering, firefighting, emergency management, mass care, emergency assistance, housing and human services, logistics management and resource support, Public health and medical services, such as search and rescue, oil and hazardous waste material response, agricultural and natu natural resources, energy, public safety and security, long-term community recovery, and external affairs. Also at the bottom of the report is the communication chain of who are the individuals that are communicated uh, with incidents and information on a need-to-know basis. So those individuals are listed in that report. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for working on this. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to suggest that when it's complete, to whatever degree it's going to be complete, that maybe there be a special presentation at council that we take a half hour or 45 minutes. I don't know, however mm -hmm. long it takes, because this is critical. And it seems like it would be good <coughs> for people in the community, one, to know that we're doing it, and to know, <laughs> two, to know what's involved in it. Yes. I think, I think that's something we've been working on. One thing, absolutely. Um, the section that we are missing is um, mapping uh, our location, uh, those kind of things for staging details. Um, some of the active threat situations are not public, um, mm -hmm. but the rest of it is. Uh -huh. and so that's the second part of this that will complete. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, we provided an update on the Vernet remediation plan, utility roundup discussion. Uh, I've taken notes on some of the things you want to see, and we will uh, bring information to the council and relevant information on the performance of this, of this program. We're also looking to secure grant funding for this program to make it sustainable. I got an email from Kevin about uh, uh, increasing our request to $10,000 um, to include not just donation money, but other um, money for, to search to ensure sustainability of the program. And Are you talking about asking the Community Foundation? No, no. For the, oh, good. We, there, there's an okay. application we're working yeah, on. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that one. Go. 
We could ask the community foundation. <laughs> Not pretend. <laughs> um, 2020 budget preparation and timeline. This is included in your packet. Uh, we are already in the process of drafting the 2020 budgets. Uh, Colleen has uh, distributed the department um, budgets, so that's taking place. That we will have internal meetings uh, through September 10th to review um, those budgets with the director of finance and myself. On, we're looking to bring a presentation to the council on October 21st. This is the initial presentation on the budget, and that we intend to introduce um, the council. For approval. That introduction scheduled for November 4th as the first reading of the ordinance to approve approving the 2020 budget for the village and a second reading November 18th. So here are the few asks that we have of you and, I, and you both uh, should have received emails on request of two sessions. So we're looking to have work sessions with council. We propose two uh, work sessions to review one, the general fund, enterprise fund, special revenue, capital funds. We would like the council's availability during the following periods to schedule two four-hour sessions to review these uh, uh, to review the the budgets. Um, I think I'll work with uh, with Judy on scheduling those work sessions. So thank you for um, uh, making your availability known for those meetings. Uh, and I've talked about the emergency plan. There are two other items I would like to discuss. One is the active transportation plan. I don't know what detail you want to go into this, Brian. And then the, uh, the uh, street sign that it's in your packet. This is the street sign to orient visitors and residents to where our Yellow Springs facilities are. How in depth you want to go with the, wa the um, Walnut Street? So have we confirmed that, did you talk to Principal Housh about So we haven't gone through the details. We've uh, continued out doing the outline on our end, how we will prep it so that when we do meet um, with the stakeholders, we have a plan in place on how we would oper operationalize that. So from so, a... So we don't, we haven't secured a date for sure with them or we know we have not but we have a tentative timeline that we've discussed internally um, so we're looking to bring a, a announcer plan at council um, we can lo we're looking to launch a communication plan on the proposal uh, around September 9th a set of barriers and road markings on the Walnut uh, Street and around the property on September 21st it is a Saturday but at this we identify Saturday so we can dedicate the resources we need to configure the space to what we need um, done. And then we would run the active transportation initiative from September 23rd through October 12th. Uh, during this period, we will collect feedback, uh, conduct observations and surveys to see how the intervention strategy is working. So now on the intervention strategy, we're looking to create uh, Walnut Street um, from Short Street to Limestone as, as one way and have it one direction, make part of the road, uh, pull in parking and make another, uh, increase the space that is dedicated for drop off and pick up. Uh, we believe that this initiative will reduce the congestion and reduce the safety hazards that are present with so many kids uh, being dropped off and picked up. And do, do we have that diagram, Judy? Or? Oh, yes, just this computer took that long okay. to get there. Um, yeah, so I, I'll just, you know, again, remind folks that um, when we did our active transportation plan, and that was developed uh, across a six-month time period, the project that rose to the top with all the public feedback that we got was to resolve the pickup drop-off um, potential hazard uh, around Mills Lawn. Um, so that suggestion was to make it one way. I think it also resolves the wonky intersection at Walnut and Limestone. And uh, at the end of the day, we want to do this as a temporary transportation project. So the schools are supporting it. So it sounds like we just need to get the final okay that we can start the last week of September. We wanted to do it before uh, the weather got too bad. And then, of course, we want to have a process for getting feedback about does this fix the problem, how do we need to tweak it, and that sort of thing. We are not going to do the back-end parking. Okay. <laughs> so for folks, yeah. yeah, so for folks that were wondering about the orientation of the parking, uh, the diagonal parking, 
that was uh, back in parking. Apparently, lots of communities embrace it. Um, I'm not sure ours would. So we're not going to, uh, that's not going to be part of the temporary transportation project and probably not going to be, I think we've already refined it. We're, we're not going to so do it that way. what would the parking be? But I think that we would want to look at angled parking in a forward direction. Um, it would maximize spaces and, uh, you know, I think it would be helpful. But my understanding is we're going to focus on the one-way thing mm -hmm. and then we'll figure out the parking stuff right. later. You know, one, one step at a time. Uh, All right. Mark, you want to oh. say something? Just one way from Limestone to Short Street? Uh, from Elm up to Limestone. So it's going one way in that mm -hmm. direction. And that's part of what we need to test out. Um, you know, there were discussions about, like, what about one way the other way? But the, um, the uh, you know, the planners thought that um, based on the information they had that it would be better to head south. Well, a lot of times I go, you know, north on 68. Yep. And then go down. Walnut Street on my way to the brewery. You know? Right. That's the way up that way, you know. Yep. And so now we have to go through downtown or go up, go over the high street and then. Right. And then over. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, you know, if we decide that it's a permanent Sign fix, right? <clears throat> you know, so, but we'll try it first and see what people think. So actually, that's a good question. Um, the The proposal was from Elm, but um, you guys are thinking about starting it at Short. Yes, we're thinking about Short, and we also have identified another opportunity. Since that we're testing Walnut, we could also test an initiative on Short Street, making Short Street one way. So coming uh, north on 68, be, being able to make that left turn onto Short as a one way, and have the lane be the left lane, and we can add additional parking on the right side, not just car parking, but also bicycle parking. And then uh, folks who, who are able to turn left on short and turn right onto Walnut at that intersection mm -hmm. point of uh, Walnut and Short Streets. So then you create another avenue for which folks that want to get to the brewery and cut, a, cut, <laughs> uh, cut across Walnut can cut down 68 turn on uh, short and then right on Walnut. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's Kenetta had a comment. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, about the wonky intersection there, is it going to be right turn only yes. off of Walnut to Limestone? Yes, mm -hmm. that's the plan. That's to have right yeah. turn only, oh. and you will avoid the congestion show that. of that mm -hmm. left turn lane. Yes, this year doesn't have it, but um, we talked about this other measure of making a right turn only to avoid mm -hmm. the congestion of the car vehicles yeah. that are looking to turn left on Limestone to turn right on 68. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One additional thing we want to do is put a left turn uh, signal on 68. Um, you may have noticed that uh, a lot of folks turn left on um, onto limestone from 68, mm -hmm. and some folks adhere to, you know, the practice of staying as far left as you can to allow cars to the right. Others don't; they stay right in the middle, and folks can get through. So we're hoping to do some road markings and also a street light, a left turn signal, so that folks are able to make that left turn and others are able to uh, bypass mm -hmm. the. Mm -hmm. the Folks that are turning left. I, uh, I have one more question, and then yeah. maybe, just as someone who uses this almost daily, um, so if I'm going down Walnut Street, let's say it's drop off time, will there be a place for? So there will be a place for people to pull off and people to continue traffic. Correct. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Um, and you know, I imagine also. I mean, this gives us an opportunity just like the, the wide crosswalk at the main entrance mm -hmm. to do something like that at the other entrance yes. for third and fourth graders. Yep. So, and then, you know, there's the fifth and sixth grader mm -hmm. thing. So, I mean, that, this would be a great way to, you know, expand that space, so. Okay, but remember, it's temporary. That's so right. we try it, we see how it works, we get feedback, and uh, I mean, ultimately, yes. You know, these are things that the community identified as needing uh, treatments. Okay. Um, all right. So, and then uh, what was the other thing? So, the feedback I needed from that we want from you guys is what do you think about the short street initiative? Is something that 
the, we didn't address in the initial concept, um, but it's a great opportunity given that we're already trying something on Walnut to try Short Street. And we can see them both as one or evaluate the feedback uh, as individual parts of the project. So, so we want to include Short Street. So I, I am game for that if you guys have thought it through and think it's you know not going to be more complicated. So, um, so you guys are good with it? All right. If we're Council. testing a new a new design, we should test it. I think that's the most excellent right. aspect of it is that we can try this out. So, we might as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Agreed. All right. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. Again? yeah. One thing that I want to make sure that everybody knows is the turn signal that goes on the traffic light. It will not be temporary. It's going to be a permanent. Oh. The, the road marking will not be won't change. But if you're coming from Clifton area mm -hmm. and you get to 343 and 68, yeah. you have an opportunity to turn left or go straight before the other light changes. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to implement down right. there coming north on 68 is to be able to have traffic clear that intersection right. versus waiting for the people to turn. Yeah, I mean, so, when I think about the temporary, I think about like the one ways yeah. and short street that one way. Will be temporary, That's temporary. When you see a turn signal, mm -hmm. that, that will be not. Sure. Right. Okay. So I think that's all I had other than we would be eliminating the drop off on limestone because we don't want traffic to be congested at that. So we work with the schools to have them drop off on walnut side as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's more space on walnut. Mm -hmm. So there'll just be a part. And I think that's something that we can work with the school on. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so the sign. Um, All right, so this is the welcome sign or the, the director of where our, our facilities and offices are. Uh, so this is the proposal from the team. It's up on the screen and on your, on your packets. Um, any feedback? We're welcome to any feedback. We've also, what, what's new on here is we added a tagline mm. right below Yellow Springs. Well, um, I think we should... I don't have an opinion one way or the other exactly about shaping our future, but I think it's something that we should get vetted for a while. I, I, like, I think the sign looks cool, and I would put village offices and then police department right under that, and maybe then have a space and have the other things be a little lower. I mean, because it's important for people to know where the village offices are, and very important for people to know where the police department. So I think those okay. should stand out. One thing that Megan just pointed out is we can also put public parking oh. on, on one of those areas mm. as well. Okay. And there's approximately the, the white space is actually a see-through, mm -hmm. and, and so there'll be a six-inch gap right there mm -hmm. between each zone. Okay. Um, and then uh, art gallery should be John Bryan Community Gallery okay. to match the sign that we have out here. Um, is So our... In terms of the colors, so are, is it going to be that burnt orange rather than this it is, orange? It will be. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure it matches our our logo colors. It and you got the new business cards. Okay, good. Um, so now I guess the other question here is uh, to council: Is are there any other items besides parking? that we would want to add, because it looks like we've got two more spaces. Well, the other thing would be the location of it. If we want to put it back in the same spot that it is now, or if we want to move it to where the flight pole is, mm. uh, facing that direction. Youth center. Yeah. You might want to Ah, uh, yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. And yeah. maybe the, the gym. Because that's different than the basketball court, I guess. Okay. It sort of reminds me a little bit the design of the little art theater, something about if that. You, so. If you scroll back down, actually my two meter readers are the ones that come up with this. And if you go out front and look at the front side of the building, that architectural design is the same as the oh. other John Bryant Center. Oh. Hmm. So where is this going? Uh, that's what I'm asking is if we want to put it back in the same location or if we want to move it to uh, where the flagpole is. 
Yeah, I, I would say the latter. I think mm -hmm. it should be more prominent, okay. like out towards the entrance. So, mm -hmm. mm. agreed. Yeah. And then if we do put it there, then we have the opportunity for other things on the back of the sign. So when you're walking back up to town, do we want to put something on the back side? Yeah, so Johnny and I talked about like we could have things like a welcoming community. Mm -hmm. You know, and that kind of, you know, some of our value statements, uh, which I like a lot. Nice. So. <coughs> Maybe <coughs> that should be the tagline. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. It is hard to see. It, it will be. Mm -hmm. we're, yeah. We're actually putting a new panel behind it and it'll be grounded. Should we put public restrooms on there? I was going to say that exactly. Yeah. yeah. Public restrooms? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> on the back side, like when people come out of their cars, so they know which way the public Okay, so let's do this. Um, I mean, I we wanted a new sign. I know, Johnny, you've been thinking about this for a long time, and it's long overdue. Um, so why don't we give it until the next meeting for any other thoughts about what should be on it, um, and then we'll make a final decision and put it in production. That'd be fine, because they're actually doing meter reads right now, so they give them a couple weeks and collect their thoughts, and then they'll assemble it. Did we catch Marianne's comment that a welcoming community, a welcoming community might be another tagline? Yeah. Mm. Well, well, so if you're lost, so, look at the back. I know. Bicycle friendly. We're, yeah, we're. Uh, we, it can't just say friendly. Yeah. Friendly. <laughs> well, maybe it needs to rotate. Because we're really not all that friendly. <laughs> Sometimes okay. friendly. Um, Sometimes friendly community. Yeah. All right. Well, exciting. Monday Thanks Wednesday. for doing that work. Yeah, Laura. Is it going to be ground mount? Ground mount. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Great. Judy. Nothing except to say thank you so much for the great summer pool staff. <laughs> Sorry to see the pool close. It was a fabulous summer. And oh, I bet those doggies are sad it? too. <laughs> All right. I don't want to get in. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so with that, uh, future agenda items. So we've obviously flagged a few things. Uh, any other thoughts for agenda planning? So I have com your commission's review as a topic for yes. new business. We'll figure that out. Yeah. Um, draft resolution supporting House Bill 229 in old business. Mm -hmm. um, supporting the Glenn resolution, just ready, ro ready to roll. Yeah. Okay. That's what I've got. All right. I I am un unhappy to say that I. I can't confirm that the health assessment results will be presented. I'm leaving it on there for now, but I may pull it. Okay. okay. So are we keeping something about the police assessment on? Or? We should. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that'll just go, that'll go on our old business. So it's, would that be to collect? To collect comments or maybe additional schedule comments. the community forum or yeah. something. Certainly yeah. additional comments okay. because I think I heard a general theme that people felt needed more time. Yeah. Rushed. We all felt rushed, the community yeah. members who came. Okay. And I guess you could be working with staff. Yes. On comments. Yes. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thanks for people who hung out the whole meeting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> staff. Uh. Yeah, you got to be stealthy.